and we are live. Okay. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Diaspora Africa Renaissance Channel. I'm your host, Ego, and I have with me Baruti and Namdi. How are you two gentlemen? Hey, how are you doing? How's everybody doing? Wow. Hello to Dr. Wright also. Yes, great. And uh, um, just to say we have a special guest with us today. We have uh, Dr. Tyreen Wright, uh, who's the author of uh, the book, Booker T. Washington and Africa, The Making of a Pan-Africanist. Uh, Dr. Wright. Uh, hails from T Tuskegee University, where she got a, uh, I believe, a PhD in public uh, in history. There, she also has a PhD in public policy, and uh, also um, teaches or taught uh, history and political science at City University of New York at Medgar Evers Medgar Evers College. So, uh, yeah, um, uh, and uh, I think um, you also have. Uh, uh, responsibilities with the uh, General of Pan African Studies right. or associated with them. And uh, yeah, just wanted to say welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just quick, you know, because people uh, always want to clarify credentials. I got my undergraduate degree from Tuskegee University. And let me just say that has nothing to do with me writing the book. Just so people know, this book comes oh. way after, but I, I was an undergraduate student at Tuskegee University in the history department. So I've got a bachelor's in science and history uh, from Tuskegee. I got a master's of arts in history, concentration, modern African history, independent struggles from the City University of New York City College campus. And my PhD is from Union which used to be Union Graduate School, but it's Union Institute and University. And it is in public policy, it's interdisciplinary studies, public policy. And my concentration, I wrote my dissertation on Booker T. Washington and African policy. So, and I currently teach at um, Mega Evers College, City University of New York. And I recently became the associate editor of the Journal of Pan-African Studies. So I'm sorry for not sending that to you in writing. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Timely fashion. Right, and so, and then, yes, I am the author of this book called Booker T. Washington in Africa, The Making of the Pan Africanists, um, which came out in 2015. 2015, okay, thank you. And uh, and the book is out, so and many people can go and, and find it. Yes. Uh, it's an excellent read. So we'll, we'll get straight into it. Right here as well. Yes. Excellent, oh, there, there it is. We have, we have it there online. So uh, it's been highly anticipated. We've been excited um, to, to have you on the show and really want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, we have a lot of questions and curiosity, um, things about Booker T. Washington that we didn't know about. But first, we'll just get into it. Why the interest in Booker T. Washington besides you going to Tuskegee? <laughs> uh, well, and, yeah, and besides that, because that really wasn't the, uh, the primary impetus for the book, not at all. I had to say to someone years before I wrote the book, like, listen, I could never do this work over, uh, because of some uh, well, alumni fervor. It just yeah. wouldn't. Uh, it just wouldn't get you there. That's not enough. <laughs> but <laughs> the interest, actually, to be quite frank, when I was uh, pursuing my PhD, I actually had a person on my committee who said why are you searching for a topic? And he had done some background on me and saw that I had written my master's thesis on uh, Booker T. Washington in Africa. And so that was published through the City University of New York City College. And he, he uh, said, you don't need to go anywhere else in terms of a topic. You need to resume your research on this topic. And um, he he was on my committee, and then later on, he's a colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Jackson. So I said, okay, you know, maybe I should. And that is how, it, you know, at least the cases I developed them. Now, fast forward several years later, after that, uh, the book is a totally different animal. So I don't want people to think that the book is the same as the dissertation. Totally different animal. Okay, the, the dissertation is as is a dissertation. <laughs> Boring, narrow, whatever. It's meant to serve a certain purpose. 
Um, but the, the book itself um, was, you know, wasn't originally titled this. It was originally Booker T. Washington in Africa, certainly, but not the making of a Pan-Africanist. And I wrote the book at least three times. Uh, and before including that subtitle in the book, because ultimately I had to, as the theorist, give some meaning to what all this activity and behavior on the part of Washington ultimately meant, right? And I think that that is the work that has gone undone by previous scholars. They did, they failed to define what Washington's role in Africa or his activity and interactions related to Africa and African people, what it actually meant, right? And so I come in and I do that work. And of course, yes, the cases are cases that had never before really seen the light of day. There's a few articles written on the Liberia crisis, almost nothing written on the African exclusion measure, just a small indication here and there. But but for the most part, these are concrete policy cases that Washington was either the key negotiator in or one of the key players in, and they were to the benefit of African people. He changed policy, he impacted policy and outcomes for African people, not just in the United States, but globally, right? In respect to the case of Liberia, right? So. But that was the impetus of the book. You know, I knew it would be controversial to say, to put Washington and Africa in the same sentence, hmm. first of all, but then even more to call him a Pan-Africanist, which the term has, uh, the concept has overwhelmingly seemed to be reserved for people like Du Bois. And it's sometimes applied to uh, Barbie, but really, Washington is the precursor to both of them. And certainly in measurable ways, uh, he is a Pan-Africanist, you know. I, and and that, was, that was, you know, one of the things I wanted to do with this book, really shift the discourse around rhetoric and, and actual practice and concrete um, results because he's not uh, theoretically a Pan-Africanist in, in, in terms of rhetoric in the public realm. But when you qualify what he in fact had done, he certainly is a Pan-Africanist. And he's very clear on who he intends to serve and how he intends to advance the interests of African people in both of these cases. So, you know, but there's a lot. There's a lot going on with Washington. He's up to a lot in that. Thank you for that. For that. Um, do you think there's been a concerted effort by those who previously wrote about Booker T. Washington to not paint him as a Pan-Africanist or to obscure that from the vision of, 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 of people? Sure, sure. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in the sense that, you know, one, I talk about this in the preface of the book, but the, the fact that this conversation has overwhelmingly in terms of Washington been mon a monopoly, a monopoly by a small set of white American male scholars who have written about Washington, Lewis Harlan being the most famous of them all. And he, in essence, uh, was able to uh, write two autobiographies on Washington edit Washington's personal papers, which is 15 volumes. Uh, and he was supported, right, by the uh, Library of Congress to do so and got tons of other funding. However, he's very open about his disdain and dislike with Washington. And this is where he and a Tuskegee alumni did come in. It came in at the fact that I had actually known and met the head archivist of Tuskegee for many, many years, and his assistant, uh, Mrs. Wilson, who was assistant archivist to Dr. Danny Hale Williams at uh, Tuskegee. And so I had some insight into Lewis Harlan's time researching Washington at Tuskegee. 
and he was editing the personal papers and knew some firsthand accounts of how he handled the collection, his attitude towards it. But then what he writes on paper is clear enough, right? He, he's, he doesn't hide that he is not a fan of Washington and not saying that you have to be in order to be a researcher, but you do need to be fair, right? And, and you do have to do what should be done scientifically, meaning that if the evidence isn't there, uh, then you, you can't make certain claims. You, you also have to be aware of interpretation. And I always felt like uh, Harlan was not an adequate interpreter as a historian of Washington's life or words or utterances in any way because they are so far apart in terms of their location in society, in their condition, their positioning, right? Washington was born in enslavement. You know, Harlan is born in the 20th century. He's He has admitted, had admitted because he is deceased, at this point, had admitted to having his own feelings, racist feelings. And here he is, the sole biographer of Washington, right? Someone who is born decades before him and in a whole nother century and survived enslavement and did things that, you know, few of us have been able to achieve even now. <laughs> so, um, so. I hope I answered your question, but you know, yeah. that, that I do think there was an intentional, uh, I guess you could say campaign almost to malign, be it Washington. I think the further you can move African people away from a program that may usher them into a level of stability and even liberation in this country, they're going to be moved away from that. And we all know how uh, we all know how it works in this country, in particular in America. If you want to uh, eliminate someone, you you engage in character assassination, mm -hmm. right? And so, if you can malign, and you have a cadre of people writing along these lines, and there is about a hundred years of history written that has maligned Booker T. Washington and in effect the Tuskegee program. Uh, and it has gone unchallenged. And that's my criticism of intellectuals like myself and others who come from this particular space that whether Washington served us or did us a disservice, he was ours, he belonged to us. So we are the ones who should weigh and measure him. Okay, and his deeds, and and certainly there should never be a monopoly um, in terms of interpretation of our leadership. And when I say our, I mean African people in the United States and those who have taken on the task and the occupation of being theorists and historians and 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 researchers around social political history in this country. Uh, earlier, um, if I can just interject for a second, um, Nandi, you and I were having a small discourse before the uh, before the show um, on why is it that people just don't know seemingly about uh, Mr. Washington's contribution in Africa, but they know so much more about uh, Du Bois uh, and Pan Africanism and Du Bois being on the ground. Uh, of writing the uh, Africana Encyclopedia for Kwame Nkrumah and actually passing away in Ghana on, on the ground in Africa. Um, if I can, Namdi, if you could go ahead and interject a question on that to Dr. Wright. I have some other things I wanted to ask about Dr. Wright, but since that was your angle or one of the angles, I think that would be a great spot right at this point for you to follow up on that point. All right. Thank you, Baruti. Um, yeah. Um, just following up on Baruti's comment, I think amongst Africans, there is a, there's a sense of clarity about um, the boy's legacy on the continent, about, you know, in regards to his country, his contribution, the pre-colonial 
um, struggle of Africa and the development of the continent as a whole. And as Barutti mentioned, you know, his works in the Encyclopedia Africana and also the fact that he played a, you know, a, a significant role in the, uh, in the independence of uh, modern day Ghana. So I think there is um, there's no doubt about the contribution of W. Du Bois amongst an Africanist on the African continent. Right. Uh, but uh, people, a lot of people don't know much about Brooker T. Washington. And I think earlier on in the conversation, you mentioned the fact that um, um, Brooker T. Washington's contribution to Pan-Africanism is actually, was actually global. And you made mention briefly about the um, uh, about Liberia. And I was wondering if you could just talk more about um, Booker T. Washington's contributions to to the Liberian crisis of 1915. Yes. Uh, so the, the Liberian crisis um, takes place, it begins in 1907 to 1912, actually. And then there's the African exclusion measure, which is in uh, the, the 1915, um, which is definitely um, a challenge to U.S. immigration policy on Africa and African people globally. Um, so what happens with it? Let me just, before I begin, let me just say one thing about Du Bois and uh, Washington. I, you know, one of the things I don't get pigeonholed into is this conversation about Du Bois, Washington, because like uh, we were talking about, Rudy and I were talking about, is that it is really not an either or. They are very different and they are born into very different contexts, okay? It's like comparing apples and oranges. They have very different functions. Um, so they're not really even uh, comparable, but they have been pigeonholed or put into comparison, right, by that history we just discussed, you know, people creating this uh, programmatic difference. But Can you tell me what the differences are, uh, Dr. Wright? Uh, I know you want to address um, Namdi's question about the about the Liberian crisis. Okay. But, but, right, but right there, can you just uh, give a small synopsis um, about the difference in context between Du Bois and Washington, either age-wise or the yeah. circumstances. So, right, so we know that Du Bois is born in the North. He's born in, um, he's born in uh, Boston. He's, he's not born into slavery. He's born after enslavement, right? And Washington is born in Virginia. He's born into enslavement. He is aware of that. He is we don't know Washington's real age, okay? It's, some people have speculated that he was born in 1850, uh, 1850 something. However, he is unaware of his own age and states that over and again. So if someone found some documents where they could, you know, really say specifically how old he was, that would be interesting. However, uh, the year not quite known. Uh, because he, obviously he's documented as property, right? Not a person, so no birth certificate, born without record. Uh, but he is born into slavery and around the age of nine, he recalls being having Union soldiers come to the plantation that he was at in Hillsford, Virginia. And he remembers them reading the Emancipation Proclamation to them, right? So he's not... The June, you know, people who would have been in the context of the Juneteenth, you know, uh, liberation. He is prior to that, right? Sure. So whenever the Union soldiers who are stationed in the South, another misconception: the the Civil War is fought in the South, right? Union troops invade the South, right? So all the United States is not created equal in the sense. If you were to ask the question, uh, has the U.S. ever been invaded? That's a trick question. The South was invaded. The Confederacy was invaded by the North. And so Union soldiers go into the South and he recalls the day he actually finds out about their emancipation from enslavement. Totally different context from Du Bois, right? Du Bois now, Du Bois, he's an interesting person. I forget the name of the essay he writes, but it's about his ancestry. And he goes all into his ancestry and his roots and he, he recalls his Dutch and even French background from, you know, European ancestry. Washington, in contrast, interestingly enough, 
uh, was sired, I would say, uh, by some r random, unknown white male from a neighboring plantation. He is aware of that. So in other words, his mother was a victim of rape. And um, the, 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 the T stands for uh, an Italian name, doesn't it? Uh, Telefero. Yeah, it's Italian. Right. Yeah. But he assumes this name. His mother gives him that name, but he assumes the name of Washington when it becomes necessary. His stepfather, who his mom was married to, marries a name, man who, is na who carried the name Washington. And when he begins to go to school after emancipation, he assumes the name out of sheer necessity as Washington, the last name. So it's in no way connected to uh, George Washington or any Washington families. He assumes the name. As many African people who survive enslavement begin to assume names and reclaim names or keep the names that were imposed on them as while they were in chattel enslavement, right? So those are two different contexts, one born in enslavement uh, aware that his very being and his very uh, condition is subject to that. He was subject to that. He was a product of it. And he calls his mother an unfortunate victim of the, the institution of slavery, meaning she didn't choose his father. She had a husband who she chose, okay? But she didn't choose who she had him from and probably could not speak the man's name, right? Who is his biological father, okay? Du Bois, on the other hand, can recall his lineage, uh, sees himself as uh, exceptional and elite for being able to do that. Now, the, there's smoke and mirrors with Du Bois' background because Du Bois, is, his mother dies at the age of 12, when he is 12. His father left the family even before that, when he is an infant. So he is technically an orphan by the age of 12 and a charge to the community there. So, you know, this idea of him being such an elite uh, individual and living a privileged life is not quite true. This was more who he saw himself as. And he invokes his lineage, which I guess he has some uh, knowledge of via his mother. Uh, but it does not afford him any privilege because had he been a white, so-called white boy born in Boston, he would have, the community would have sponsored him to go to Harvard. He does not. They sponsor him to go where? Fisk. Okay. A black school. Okay. In the deep South, because Tennessee is the deep South. <laughs> So he goes to school and Washington, as we know, walks to Hampton, another black college. Now, both of these black colleges are schools that are not in the same vein as Tuskegee. Hampton is ran by Armstrong. Fisk is created by whites for black people, right? And, and ran by whites for many years. Uh, and so the point is, is that Washington does obtain education via hard work. He is not sent to school. He is a laborer at the school. And as a way, as a, as a, as payment, he is able to attend and get his education, right? Mm -hmm. Du Bois goes from Fisk back to where he felt he should have rightfully been, which is Harvard. And he is the first PhD in history, Black man to get his PhD in history from Harvard. And then he doubles back and, you know, begins to try to essentially teach. He does teach at black institutions. He has, he goes around to, you know, he teaches at many institutions over the course of his career, but he does not achieve a high rank in our, any of that or the accolades he probably was deserving of, right? He finally ends up at Clark Atlanta, and of course, he ends up in some political issue there 
uh, with the administration and, and ultimately leaves, right? And begins to work as the editor for the magazine produced by the NAACP. And, that, and I'm giving a short, brief, whatever, overview, but Washington is very different. He gets sent to Tuskegee by Armstrong. And, and I would even argue, although I have not uh, spent and paid special attention to this issue, the relationship between Armstrong and uh, General Armstrong, the founder of Hampton and Washington is not exactly what people think. Uh, so I have some primary sources that imply, uh, Doc, Doc, uh, Mrs. Wilson being one of them, the head of the, the assistant archivist at the archives for many, many years, Tuskegee Archives, who indicated that more work needs to be done on that relationship between Armstrong and Washington, right? And, and Armstrong may have wanted to get Washington out of, uh, out of Hampton. <laughs> so when the, the inquiry for a principal comes, for, comes to Hampton, Armstrong rep recommends Booker T. Washington. And he is very young. He's 26 years old. And this is a school that actually comes out of the community. And that is the significant difference about Tuskegee. This is something that is born out of the community. I won't belabor the point, but essentially someone named Lewis Adams is really the conceptual founder of Tuskegee. And he after executing a political favor for a senator, uh, Foster, for re-election, because Tuskegeeans are very astute political coming out of Reconstruction and even after the end of Reconstruction, they are voting, they're progressive there for the most part. Uh, Arm, uh, I'm sorry, Adams, Lewis Adams, actually, when asked what he wants, he says, I want a school for my people. And that initiates the Negro Normal School at Tuskegee for teachers. Okay, so that and, that, and I'll get back to that later on, but for teachers. And what that does is Foster went to the state level and said, you know, we want to initiate this school. Uh, the people there are prepared to initiate a school and they got a $2,000 allotment for the Negro Normal School at Tuskegee. Uh, but they had no building, they had no nothing but $2,000 to pay teachers that they would recruit. And, and, and that is the case for a while until Washington comes and is able to establish the school and he raises the school. And this is why he, I, I would say he is the father of Tuskegee, but not the conceptual founder of the institution. And Washington in 1893 makes the institution independent of the state of Alabama. He says, keep your $2,000, I can raise more money on the road and he's kind of confident about that and he makes the institution independent which i think is so important and is really truly a mark of something washington would do he gives the institution to the people and so today I mean, i've said i said this all the time when i get a chance to do this in the book this is part of the reason why tuskegee is quasi private has a very unique classification it is private but state affiliated when it needs to be and uh, that is very much a, a mark of Washington, a very shrewd and um, adequate politician and negotiator, meaning that he understood the power of taking that institution back from the state of Alabama, okay? And so it is, its classification has always been a little, is very different from a lot of schools that come about during that period that were created by white individuals for black people, you know, be it, Howard, uh, even Lincoln, all of these schools, a lot of them, they were uh, created by white people for black people, whereas Tuskegee was born out of the community, people who had survived enslavement, and they had that in common with Washington, you know, so my point, though, is that the two would have totally different contexts and are generations apart. And uh, they are contemporaries, they're living at the same time, but they are not cohorts. And this is part of what we'll see over time uh, as Du Bois' issue with Washington. 
the fact that they were not cohorts, that Washington was the senior of two and far more powerful at, at that time than you know he was, right? And so he did take uh, exception to some of Washington's politics. And I'll leave it there if you want me, and then I'll, you know, I'll let you prompt me to get into the difference, the programmatic difference. Yeah, yeah. So now, now that we got that out of the way, I was wondering if you could now um, tell us a bit more about the African, uh, the African exclusion okay, so measure and the, uh, the Liberian two, uh, crisis. Um, cases that are in the book are the Liberian crisis and the African exclusion measure. The Liberian crisis began in 1907 with a letter from a representative who was um, stationed in Liberia. So he's a U.S. representative who is stationed in Liberia. And he is there to basically take the temperature of the situation on the ground. And his name is Mr. Lyons, right? And he writes Washington because what is happening in Liberia is that the French and the British and even German, but primarily the French and the British are fighting on the ground and, and threatening to annex Liberia. In other words, they both are attempting to encroach on the territory that is known as Liberia. And they are only open to one other alternative to them taking this territory and that is the united states stating its claim to liberia well the united states at this time is not interested in liberia it is more focused on south america and claiming territories in that region in the americas so they are not inclined to assert any claim to liberia in spite of how liberia was created right I mean, you know, Liberia has a very complex history, right? 1847, the, the, the American Colonization Society, which make no mistake about it, is a thoroughly racist uh, um, organization is, you know, initiating this. And then we have, of course, numerous people who, uh, African people who survive enslavement, who are willing to give up everything they have to repatriate to Africa. And Liberia is that hope. It comes out of great hope to return to the continent, but we know that it goes very uh, wrong on many levels, okay? So, but what is happening on the ground is that the French, the British, and the German colonial forces are threatening to take Liberia. And they are only they will only uh, back up to the United States, who at the time had Navy ships sitting off the coast of Liberia. Liberia is one of only two African nations that have never been colonized. The other is Ethiopia, as we know. And so what ends up happening is Lyons, Mr. Lyons writes Booker T. Washington. He deliberately chooses him. He does not choose Du Bois, who he felt was not positioned within American society to do so. Washington is the well-known advisor to Roosevelt. And he would go on during the course of this case to become an advisor of Taft. Um, so Washington responds. He says that he's gonna do everything he can. Uh, and he begins to pretty much discuss this via his personal papers. This is all evidenced in, in Washington's personal papers. He begins to uh, talk to and write Roosevelt about this very issue. Roosevelt agrees to give his support. However, as we know, uh, we don't know what that means initially, right? Because anybody could say, hey, you know, I support that. All right, whatever. The United States at that point, though, had consciously and conclusively, after being uh, asked on numerous occasions by both the British and the French, what were their claims? State your claims to Liberia, right? Because they're saying, we, we want to take this. We're going to take this territory. So unless you guys state your claims, we're going to annex this. And they are in competition with each other on the ground. The British 
threatened to imitate the French on opposing borders. If you take this much land, we're going to take this much land. And so ultimately, nothing will be left, right? In the irony, right? And the audacity of imperialism and colonialism, right? To stake claims to a territory. You will not be independent. The only way you could not be annexed by us is if some other Western power states claim to a territory that you have no right to, the audacity. But that was the condition. And Washington is the person who becomes the key negotiator. It is a five year long case. And he weathers many storms, but in short, to tell you what happened to this, and this is, this is a real critical case because it does lead to uh, some of the things we see come up in the 20th century with Liberia meaning you know the conflicts with the americo liberian population and the indigenous liberian population and this institutionalized uh system of marginalization and discrimination against the indigenous african person this is why you have a, just a passing on of power amongst americo liberians however it's important to understand that washington is very critical of this he found that problematic. He gives specific recommendations to uh, Liberian officials, being, of course, obviously, American Liberian officials who are in leadership positions at that time. But he is very critical of what has happened in the country as a result of the African population who has resettled from America being called the Americo Liberian population, right? Um, but during the course of the case, what happens is, is Washington begins to initiate uh, uh, a delegation in Liberia to visit the United States so that there can be direct negotiations. Anybody knows about diplomacy? That is not generally how it happens per se. Uh, maybe the president of the country might come but not necessarily a delegation. In this instance, there is a delegation of the vice president. If you look at the book, though, there's a great money shot in the book and, and in shadow on the cover of the book, that is the Liberian uh, delegation to the U.S. in the garden at Tuskegee. And that's why it's there, because it is the evidence that this commission and delegation comes to the United States and Washington wants to have great pomp and circumstance for them. Roosevelt is like, no way, Liberia is in a bad way. But Washington is saying like, these are our people who survived enslavement and go back to the continent of Africa and are trying to forge and build their own nation. Certainly they deserve some recognition. Of course, Roosevelt, he was not going for that. Uh, you know, Roosevelt is in, conversation and is being advised by Washington, but we should, still shouldn't confuse him as someone who is wholly and completely on the side of African people in any way, shape or form. Okay, so, and Washington knows that. Um, there's a whole conversation to be had by, by about or around dialogue, rhetoric, and how one speaks to people with power and how one leverages power. Washington is a master of that and their per his personal conversation with Roosevelt reveals that. But just to keep it simple for this conversation, Washington invites this delegation. They are initially coming in through Washington, D.C. Roosevelt says, hey, Liberia is in a bad way. There will be no pomp and circumstance for them. Washington says, no problem. I will host them in Tuskegee. He brings them to Tuskegee. He has six or seven days of programs and interaction and this is where you get that image of them all sitting in the garden at Tuskegee and then he brings them back to Washington DC where he is the host of a secret meeting uh between Roosevelt Taft incoming president Taft right he's the president elect at this time because there was a uh it is a transfer well, a change of administration during this period, and that's an important thing to remember, but also Secretary of State Elihu Wu. Now, this is not normal, okay? And this is why it's so funny about what makes their, its way to the public realm. Washington, people made a big deal, of, you know, 
of Washington going to dinner at the White House. That was not a big deal. Washington was a regular at the, uh, you know, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt White House and, and coalescing with his administration. This meeting, as documented through Washington's personal papers and in the book, would take place in the evening around 7 p.m. The whole delegation would come to the White House and those U.S. officials, as I stated, Elihu Wu, uh, who is, um, is the Secretary of State, incoming President Taft, and Roosevelt. Why did Washington do it this way? He did it this way because he felt that the difference in what would happen with Liberia would be whether or not the new administration decided to be honorable with all the negotiations that took place. And so he is trying to protect the negotiations that this Liberian delegation makes with the Secretary of with the State Department. It is unusual for any nation to actually negotiate in this way, a secret meeting at the White House with the president, minute, president, present administration and the incoming administration or those presidents and their uh, staff, right? The head of the, uh, the uh, State Department. But this was done uniquely to protect these negotiations because obviously Washington does not trust them a 110%. You see in the course of the case, he feels like he has to stay in touch with them, stay over them, keep reminding them, keep putting uh, Liberia on the agenda. And so out of that, there comes some negotiations and then the initiation of a commission to Liberia to see what, or a delegation to Liberia to see what the negotiation, what the conditions on the ground actually were. were. Um, side note, at this time, like I stated before, the U.S. Uh, government had uh, military forces, the Navy specifically, sitting off the shore of Liberia and coming on shore periodically to put down clashes between the American Liberian and the indigenous Liberian population. Uh, however, beyond that, they are not willing to do anything, okay? And why? Why aren't they? They're, the United States is not willing to do anything because at this point in time, in 1907, in these early years of this particular case, the United States has not figured out uh, how they can exploit Liberia. They are not tuned in just yet to the fact that Liberia has rubber and they are not in tune with all the other ways that they can exploit strategically Liberia, okay? And, and out of this case, some of these things will be revealed and that it, that comes out in the final negotiations. Let me be clear about my position on this case. It is not the best deal and we have to be honest about these things and critical about them because then we do what others have done in misleading people about uh, circumstances, meaning if someone does something with someone else on the behalf of Africans, then overwhelmingly it's to the benefit of Africans? No, sometimes it's not. The deal that ends up being cut is a survive to fight another day deal, okay? There are some serious shortcomings, but after the negotiations fail and there, the deal that is presented before the Senate does not get passed and adopted, there are under the table negotiations where Washington is part of brokering a multinational um, loan that pays off the French and the British in order to get them to not annex these territories in that is Liberia, okay? Wow. Part of what the United States does as a result of that is with Liberia, they have figured out that they can exploit the rubber market there and they set up Firestone. They set up a US military base and a couple of other caveats that are to their benefit. But what happens is that Liberia survives to open, obviously fight another day. Not the best deal. We should never talk about it as the best deal. Washington's conversation 
um, in terms of negotiations is very different with the United States government than the conversation he is having with Liberian officials. He is telling them, he is having an inside conversation with them, and he is giving them some insight in how to deal with the United States in terms of keeping Liberia on the U.S. agenda. One of the things he does, which dispels this idea of him as someone who did not support political um, power and advancement and political rights, as invoked by the the uh, as claimed by the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments, right? Freedom, the right uh, citizenship, right naturalization, and the right to vote. One of the things that happens in this case that dispels Washington's uh, position as someone who wasn't for political rights is the fact that Washington uses the black vote as a wager in negotiations in this instance. So if you go back to that case, you'll see there's correspondence between Roosevelt and Washington where he says, please remember that when voting time comes, whatever you do, or fail to do with regard to Liberia will be remembered by the 4 million, he uses the term Negroes, I'm gonna use the term Africans, yeah. Yeah. in the United States. And so here's this man who in the public realm is not supposed to be a advocate of political and social um, integration and progress. Here he is leveraging the vote of the African population in America that has been naturalized and given the right to vote against what the United States will do to this independent African nation on the continent of Africa. It is really interesting and perplexing because um, it is a threat, <laughs> right? It's a threat. It's not a, a it's not a, um, it's not a compliment or anything away He's saying, hey, what you do or fail to do, you will pay for at voting time, okay? So we see that, but then you see Washington at the end, and I can't give it all away and tell you all the details, it's a long case, but most importantly, one of the things that Washington, Washington gives his own uh, recommendations to Liberian, Liberian officials. He says one of them, and this is off the top of my head, so I'm gonna give you the most important ones. One of them, he says, the chief issue in Liberia is you must resolve the americo liberian and indigenous liberian conflict you must resolve it it will end the nation it will be the destruction of the nation and the indigenous african person the indigenous liberian has a legitimate problem and issue okay that should not be ignored okay in other words you don't resolve how you came there and settled and, and the fact that you institutionalize a discriminatory system, a system of discrimination against the indigenous African person, um, if you don't resolve that, this will be the death of the nation. And we know that, that this settlement, this resettlement of the African population from the US into Liberia has been the source of conflict from that century into the next. Okay, and, and gave birth to a uh, long line of power being harbored and, and uh, monopolized by America Liberians, all the way up to Taylor and obviously in many wars as a result of it. Okay, so he warns them, and he is not, because some people who have not read the book have assumed that Washington was just in the posture of the typical America Liberian who had developed an anti-African position within the nation. That is not true. That is not true. He is giving the appropriate criticism to the appropriate people. These are actually America Liberians he is talking to. He's saying, you've got to resolve that. You cannot come and resettle in peace. You cannot not do that and ignore it. Okay, it is the source of a huge problem that gives birth to, as we know, many years of war in the nation. All right, and, and, and just the hypocrisy involved in 
Africans who had survived enslavement in America being in Africa and even doing that. Okay, very problematic. And, and so we should we should be critical of that role and position. And, and that should be a cautionary tale about how Africans in America engage African people in Africa who have not been displaced by enslavement. It is a very important point. Dr. That, Rella, yes. what, what, right. if you would if you would do me a favor if possible, um, could I have a I have a, a question and a uh, a comment for you, but if you could before I give that, could you um, by chance use the the comments that you made about the Liberian crisis to uh, make a brief comment in regard to the end part of uh, Nambi's uh, question about the African Exclusion Act. If you could just transition those comments about the Liberian crisis into a synopsis about the African Exclusion Act. And then I have a question and comment following that. Okay, so one thing before I just go to that, I just want to finish one thing, which is that the recommendations, the other recommendation was about what I think we're going to get to later about the economic piece. One of Washington's main recommendations to uh, Liberia, one of the three important ones, was that uh, Liberia needed to establish industry. And he specifically talks about every time you open a can that has been brought into Liberia, you seal the fate of Liberian people in poverty. And so in other words, he's saying, stop importing Western goods. Stop it. Don't consume their stuff. I want to say something else, but stop consuming their stuff. You know, he's telling them. And you seal the fate of Liberia. He's saying, produce, produce what you consume. Okay? Because when you import Western goods, they tax you to, to put what you grow right under your feet in a can. Okay, and you seal the fate of Liberia and Liberians in poverty. And so he's very critical, you know, about that. And so that this whole concept of independence through industry is one of the Tuskegee um, principles, models, values that he seeks to export to the continent. Is very aware of how it will change the reality and the condition of African people on the continent when they are producing what they consume, okay? Um, but you, I, I, I'm assuming, Rudy, that you're referring to the comment I made to you about uh, the US official saying to Washington, oh, you can, Booker T. Washington, oh, you can help Liberia as a American, at which you are, and not as a Liberian, which you are not. Are you referring to that? Well, no, well, no, not necessarily. I was just um, piggybacking on the last part of um, Namdi's question to you when he wanted you to uh, give a brief um, synopsis about the African Exclusion Act. Okay. And then after that, I have a, a, a question and a comment for you. Okay. So let me just end, close that little Liberia piece out with, you know, I opened that chapter on that case with... Um, saying, quoting Washington is saying, nobody, no one, not even the Liberian, native Liberian is more interested in the fate of Liberia than I am. Okay, so that lets you, that locates him, that lets you know his position, not just in America, but in the world, right, as relates to Africa. Uh, so with the African exclusion measure, the African exclusion measure, once again, is an international case. It is just to be specific because people, there's a little confusion about what exactly it was. It is an amendment to the larger immigration bill of 1915. It is an amendment that was injected by the Senate a senator named James Reed out of Missouri. And I'm, go figure, Missouri, right? <laughs> but Missouri. Uh, this senator initiates this, this amendment as a result of one specific thing. 
He initiates it because the completion of the Panama Canal had just taken place in 1914, November of 1914. And if anybody knows what the Panama Canal is, is it's obviously when uh, the United States under Theodore Roosevelt executes a, uh, a, a engineering project, project to cut across the land in between Central America and South America. Really, uh, in, in national terms, that land mass was known as Colombia, but the United States uh, fuels the conflict there between the Black population and the Colombian government, and a certainly racist uh, uh, scenario going on in that region, but it fuels uh, the conflict to the benefit of the of pat of people who would call themselves Panamanians today, and that was that's what gives establishment of Panama. Anyway, the point is is that they cut through the land right in that area of the continental U.S. Right, because they are actually connected. It's a series of chain locks that close and elevate ships so that ships can cross from the Gulf, right, the Atlantic, over to the Pacific Ocean. Now, everyone knew that whoever did this so that ships didn't have to go around these continents, these, these large land masses, they would be, uh, would rise to the level of a world power, a superpower. It would make, we would open up the waterways between the two major oceans, right, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> and so, right, exactly. So it cuts across there and it allows people to trade, right? Send products between the East and the West without having to go around these major land masses. Well, first off, the labor force on this project, and this is an American uh, endeavor under Theodore Roosevelt, the labor force, however, on this project are Africans from the Caribbean, Central and South America. And they are in fact paying US wages, okay? Uh, but they are a black and African population, right? Who also had survived slavery, right? And this is, hmm. the time is 1914 when it's completed. Side note, the French had tried this and failed, right? To create a, opening up of, a, of the waterways between the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, and they didn't, they, they failed. Ro under Roosevelt, they are successful. However, it is an American, American project. The professionals and the, the U.S. military is present, and the administrators on the project are white Americans and, and military persons. The laborers are overwhelmingly African people, I would say African people. They may consider themselves and may not today or then consider themselves black people, but they are identifiably African. Let's just say it that way, right? This is completed in 1914. On the last, before the last day of the year, on the last day of the year, Senator Reed on December 31st, 1914, he proposes this amendment to the larger <clears throat> immigration bill to exclude anyone of the black or African race from immigrating to the United States. And that in effect would lock out that population who just finished working on the Panama Canal. In other words, Thank you for your labor. But on the question of immigration, even though you have gotten used to American wages, the answer is no. And they wanted to make it very clear because they felt that that was the reasonable and predictable next step of the Black and African population who had been overwhelmingly the laborers and the people who suffered the most deaths as a result of laboring on the Panama Canal, which was lock, stock, and barrel, a American endeavor. Mm -hmm. 
when he proposes, read, when he proposes a couple of other amendments of the same nature, nature to close out, to lock out other groups of people from the East, non-white, non-European people, those measures do not pass. As soon as he fine tunes his amendment to say anyone of the black or African race, it passed with fine colors in the Senate that night, December 31st, 1914. And part of that clause highlighted that those people would be locked out, they would be locked out on the same basis as anyone who was a criminal or undesirable attempting to enter the United States. So racial, so once again, the criminalization of African people via immigration policy, not, you know, so not just uh, racial marginalization and exclusion, but a criminalization of that population based on African identity and blackness, right? And so it was swiftly adopted without an argument. And if, you, if any of you are familiar with the congressional records and how you can see the conversations, all of these conversations are written out, right? So you can see the debate. You can go back and see everyone who spoke, what their arguments were, what they said, who objected, all of that. There was no debate over this, okay? It passed conclusively with no challenge in the Senate. So that tells you something about the Senate at that moment in time. Now, the irony of the case is that while it is called the African exclusion measure, as, as I write about it, um, it is not designed to necessarily target African people coming from the continent of Africa. Meaning this, it would lock anyone who looks black or is coming from Africa out in effect in effect, in practice. However, it was specifically designed to lock out the African population who was not calling themselves African and possibly not calling themselves black from Central and South America and the Caribbean, okay? Uh, that is who it was targeting, but it would have been a blanket policy that would have been put in effect against anyone who was black or African, okay? Attempting to immigrate into the United States. The next week, which would have been the first week of 1915, the amendment, the whole bill, the larger immigration bill was due to go before the Congress, the House of Representatives. And so Washington in the midst between December 31st and that first week of December, he, get, he gets whims, he gets word of this measure. He is someone who was reading the congressional record, okay? He kept an eye on them. And that tells you another thing about Washington, because I don't think that you read the congressional record. So uh, I don't know, maybe you are interested in the policies and the politics, but he is not an advisor to any U.S. president at this moment in time. Woodrow Wilson is president, and he is not a, an advisor to Woodrow Wilson. So he has no soft power in his capacity. He is not in advisory to Woodrow Wilson. Um, so, but he, he's not feeling safe. He reads the congressional record. He wants to know what they're up to. And he sees this. He communicates with some people he is familiar with who are stationed on the Panama Canal, uh, who confirm that this, the practices that are there and that this intention to block this particular population from immigrating into the United States. Uh, and he, he jumps into action. I will leave it there. He, 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 the definitive difference between Washington and all of his critics and other people who have um, what we would call soft power in terms of viewed as the leadership of African people in America at the time is that he has some measure of real power enough to impact U.S. immigration policy and, and the, the significant uh, 
how would you say the significant uh, mechanism he has at his disposal is the Tuskegee machine. Uh, but he challenges this measure in three different ways. He challenges it in the black press. So he, he airs them out in the black press and he identifies all the nations that this would impact. Puerto Rico, which is not a Commonwealth of the United States at this moment in time, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, <laughs> uh, places where, you know, people today would not necessarily even call themselves black and very likely would not call themselves African. Uh, these, uh, he identifies these populations and these places. And he also is aware of their immigrating to the United States. Why? Because Tuskegee itself is a hub for our students coming from this part of the world, from the Caribbean, from Central and South America, and certainly from Africa. Uh, but he knows that it's not really directed at Africa because just the year before, if you look at immigration uh, records, you have only about four to 500 African people coming from the continent of Africa at that time with already really strict and stringent uh, immigration laws being on imposed on African people coming from Africa. So we know that it wasn't, it was, we know that it was not targeting that population. It would cover that population, but it was targeting the African population from the Caribbean, Central and South America. And it airs a great and ferocious conversation on the floor of the House, House of Representatives specifically around Jamaica and Africans coming from Jamaica and and what that means. And you, I don't put it in this book. I give you a taste of it because there's another book coming where I will give the full out conversation. Uh, but there is, like I said, a ferocious debate on both sides between Republicans and Democrats, North and South around this measure, what it means. Washington manages to give his words that are published in a paper on the floor of the House in this debate through a congressman from New York. Uh, but it is very revealing. Okay, so some of these things, these misconceptions about attitudes about various types of African people who immigrate to the United States, all of these uh, notions and attitudes are revealed in this debate. And I think it would be quite shocking for uh, people who have some misconceptions about preferences in the United States around African populations um, to see that because there is no preference really, okay? <laughs> However, Washington was able to level through his Tuskegee machine, his own words challenging this measure and the Tuskegee machine, which for people who haven't heard about it is a secret network of power brokers, people, who have power, who have money, who are able to go into certain spaces and negotiate. What he does is, you know, it's very complicated because some people that people may think are Washington's public enemies are part of this Tuskegee machine. They go to Washington, Grimke is one of them. He challenges, they go into um, the, the state house, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, into the Congress as they're holding session and they are able to challenge individual representatives, Congress people, get them to force a poll of the Congress, are actually lobbying directly various individuals, making them reveal their positions so that they can have direct conversations. And Washington, you'll see in the case, he uses this words to his uh, captains in his Tuskegee machine. He says, go to Washington, D.C. and pull every string possible to defeat this unfair measure. In other words, it was nothing too high or too low that he was willing to do to uh, get this measure thrown out, okay? And, and listen, let me just say a side note. I don't wanna get into like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with what he did, but what we have never seen in the history of our people in this country in a very overt way is someone who functions like that, okay? Who says, I don't care what string you pull, you better pull it on behalf of our people. And we're not talking about these people right here sitting in our backyard. We're talking about African people 
around the world, okay, whatever we have done here, whatever has been the fruits of our labor, we will not allow this country along racist lines to close the doors to African people who have never been an adverse population in this country, okay? And, and I think America should be very thankful for that, that we have never been an adverse population in this country, okay? Because there would be a lot of trouble. It would be more than protest. And so my point is, is that he's saying, pull whatever string you have to pull, okay? <laughs> uh, I don't care, pull it. I, I don't have any standard, okay? But we're not gonna allow this to happen. And this covers all African people. And yes, it wasn't, Washington knew that the African people who would come into America would benefit from all the struggle and all the things and accomplishments that had been done by African people who had been there. You know, he's not oblivious to that. This is a man who survived enslavement. You know, it's side note, it's very important. And this is one of the things I'm currently working on theoretically and writing about is that we've got to reframe the conversation around what happened in this country. Meaning that we African people in this country, we fought a war to end the institution of the enslavement. It was not ended by white men. And so therefore we understood what the fruits of our labor were in this country. Do you understand? We we liberated our bodies via a war. And so he was saying, no, you can't deny anybody, any other African person, the benefits of what we've done here, and I won't let you do it. And on this rare occasion, Monroe, Trotter, Du Bois, and Washington are all aligned, but Washington proves to be the only one who has a significant measure of power to defeat this measure in one week, okay? None of them could have done that. Um, and if something like this ever happens again, make no mistake about it, there may not be enough of us in position to influence what happens in something like the Congress to make sure it doesn't pass. Do you get what I'm saying? That's the consciousness that's and, that's and the resources. That's why we have the Black Caucus. I, 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 I thought that that was the role the Black Caucus in Congress was supposed to play. The role in black the black workers in Congress. I want I will I want to understand or I want to believe that that's the role the black caucus in Congress is supposed to play to look after the interests of not just black people in America, but black people around the world. But I don't know, I don't get the sense that the black caucus in the Congress plays are playing that role. Um I'm that, gonna, that, I'm gonna have no comment on that. I'm just gonna say to that. Black presence does not always mean black progress. Dr. Wright, thank, thank you for that. Um, I I wanted to frame, if I would, uh, something, a comment, and then a, a question for you. In my uh, in my initial reach out to you by by email, mm -hmm. I um, I referenced the fact that I like you. Um, I'm an alumnus of a STEM uh, intensified directed uh, HBCU, yours being Tuskegee University and mine, mine being North Carolina A&T. And I mentioned that these two uh, institutions, like other uh, STEM driven uh, HBCUs, had a pillar of philosophy that industrialization and skills would be the basis for building you know, black empowerment. And uh, in my email, and I, I pulled it up here, I, I mentioned that in trying to come up with maybe um, an overall concept and set of ideas that we could talk about for an eventual show, which we're doing today, I mentioned that, and I'm reading from my email, I said, what I specific, specifically had in mind in terms of topic would be your thoughts and perspectives on whether the African diaspora in the United States had crippled itself, uh, had crippled itself economically and in a pan-African philosophical sense by largely buying into the notion 
that Booker T. Washington was wrong about the merits of black industrialization, technology, and separate development. I wanted to get your, your quick comments and reactions to that. And then after that, if you can remember, on page 67 of your book, you mentioned the term Volk culture. Ah. And um, one of the things I was thinking about when you mentioned about the, the Liberian uh, crisis and Mr. Washington's um, involvement in Liberia, uh, in Liberia for uh, agricultural uh, linkage of Tuskegee with uh, African peoples on the ground in Liberia. There was also another point in your book where you had also mentioned about a project in, in the Sudan. And obviously the project in the Sudan and Liberia came after a previous uh, African linkage in Togo. Right. And I think uh, when I read parts of your book and also talked with you, you had uh, mentioned that Mr. Washington had grown in consciousness about the conditions on the ground of African peoples there underneath um, the beginnings of colonial rule in these different spots whether it be in Liberia or in the Sudan, and best how to deal with navigating around white people to make things better for African people in Tuskegee's venture. But you did mention that, in fact, in the Togo situation, he was growing in consciousness, or he grew in consciousness, had grown in consciousness in the Sudan and Liberia, but uh, there were some situations of growing that he needed to do when he first initiated the ventures in Togo, which was cotton production uh, engagement in which Germany was uh, the colonial master at the time. And you mentioned um, Volk culture as a uh, type of um, institutionalized colonialism that the Germans had. So I wanted you to talk about Volk culture, just give a brief uh, explanation of that. But at the same time, if you could respond to my initial comment about um, did, you know, did black people hurt themselves and Africa too by going away from the Booker T. Washington model of industrialization uh, in preference really, I guess at the time of more of an integrationist idea uh, that uh, W.E. Reed Boys would have been promoted. Right. Um, so, okay, so I took some notes while you're, you asked the questions. Uh, I might have to get you to restate certain parts of that, but just to start out with um, the benefit of the Tuskegee uh, model and, and STEM programs. Yes. Okay. So just to get a full understanding of um, what Tuskegee was so people understand because it's a misrepresentation to think that Tuskegee was uh, solely a, a uh, industrial and agricultural school. It was not, right? Uh, which is why I made a point to uh, mention the original name of Tuskegee which was the uh, Negro Normal School at Tuskegee for teachers, okay? So it is a school for teachers and uh, that is its first and second charter uh, in 1881. And then in, in, again in 1893, when Washington makes the institution independent, it is still an institution for teachers that teaches the academics and mastery of at least two trades for the purpose of uh, those teachers going forward and being able to teach the academics and teach people the industries, right? Whatever industries they chose to master, right? And and, and hopefully even uh, provoke their initiating institutions in the case of elizabeth wright some people may not know elizabeth wright is the founder of 
Voorhees College, which is an industrial is an industrial school in South Carolina. She is a Tuskegee alumna. Okay, uh, and so she actually follows the model. She says that she considers herself the same kind of woman as Washington is the same kind of man. <laughs> so she's a. Uh, She's saying that she's mirroring Washington. Um, that being said, uh, Tuskegee has 44, had 44 industries. And the concept was that there was a programmatic aversion to producing unfinished goods. So the, the, the idea was to produce fully completed products, not partially completed products, uh, completed product, right? As I always say, you know, a, not a wheel, but a wagon, okay? And they were graded uh, based on that um, in terms of the industries they chose to engage. Um, but also, too, Tuskegee is, uh, like I said, a school from teachers. So from the beginning, you have the understand, not the understanding, but the original curriculum, which is inclusive of history. And Du Bois would have known this because he spent a great deal of time in Tuskegee. But he also but it was also inclusive of pedagogy. And then we all know that the only people who study pedagogy for the most part are people who are teachers or who intend to teach. Okay. It is probably I don't know, maybe most people should study pedagogy because it is, um, in essence, the art of transferring information, the art of teaching, but really the art of transferring knowledge, which I think many people could probably uh, benefit from in terms of communication. However, the point is, is that uh, that is a characteristic of a school for teachers and it was chartered as such. So although there was a perfecting of the industries, agriculture being one of them, right? Because as of 1895, you have George Washington Carver come on board and um, lead the school of agriculture, uh, and he, you know, he he is someone who locally implements the Tuskegee program by sharing its program uh, agricultural practices and all of that with local Macon County farmers uh, in in the Tuskegee area, right? Because this is really a, a you have to understand that the institution is born out of the community. Today, it is very different. So let me just make sure I say that what I'm talking about is the Tuskegee of old, right? It's original model. I am not talking about present day Tuskegee University, which is has some of the same, uh, some of the same programs, but it is uh totally in the hands of uh you know different power different leadership and uh you know maybe sometimes lives up to the original model but possibly not okay not to take anything away from my alma mater but it, it is a very different institution right we're talking about the original model as it stood at this time between 1895 and 1915 which is also known as our nadir our lowest point post our emancipation in uh, the United States, our being African people uh, here. So there was always an emphasis on these industries because Tuskegee was not just a teaching school that taught mastery of these industries, but it was a school that also practiced these industries in order to sustain itself, okay? And this is part of the uh, where this concept of independence through industry. So they are pioneering agricultural practices, right? They are pioneering um, practices in all, just about all of the industries. And this is part of what ends up being uh, the point of connection between Barbie and Washington, because in 1912, there would be a conference called the International Conference on the Negro held at Tuskegee where these 44 industries are opened up to examination by all those connected to Africa and the African world. It was in effect a uh, Washington's Pan-African Conference. 
because it is specifically and uniquely designed this conference to allow people connected to Africa and the African world, right? To come examine the industries and take back the best practices that they see working there at Tuskegee to some part of the African world. And at that conference, uh, you have eight educators, teachers from Jamaica who take back evidence and word of this model that is Tuskegee back to Jamaica and share it with Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey initiates his relationship with Washington via a letter at that point. In the book, there's a picture of the conference, just people walking outside, but you see the people gathering. And it is an original image from the Tuskegee archives of this particular conference. Um, so we lose out on all of this when we buy into this, it was the either or program for African people, right? We lose out on all the models that were in practice there. Uh, we always end up coming back to the economic piece, even now, okay? Um, however, yes, I think that just to directly delve into what I think you might be implying by your question, yes, this model would have been an effective model for our sustainability liberation independence within the united states as much as possible it would have made us as independent and sustainable as possible and i don't want people to think that we didn't do this this was done over and over and over again tuskegee is one of the many industrial sustainable african communities in the united states at that time but it's not the only it is one of many. It is one that uh, survived without being overtly destroyed, and probably because of the politics of Washington. Um, however, most of them were destroyed, right, with sheer violence, not with politics, with violence. Okay, and that's what's so important to understand about America. Okay, like. Um, at this point in history, many people have referenced that black competition to whites was extinguished just with violence, okay? They didn't use any system. They used full out, unchecked violence, okay? And that should tell you about something about the culture of America, because this is a period that people, you know, many historians and other people who uh, interpret the history of this country seldom like to recall because of the rampant violence not to say that we're living in a best less violent time but it was completely unchecked okay there was no march to have or anything like that you had two three four five lynchings per week and washington was mapping that right with the collection of the data via newspaper clippings uh, about lynching and produces the largest collection of lynchings that exist in this country called the Tuskegee University lynching files, but he's watching them because this is what's happening. So yes, this propaganda that there was a programmatic difference between Washington and Du Bois, one advocating for political and social rights and integration and the other advocating for just an industrial, laborer model right and not even so much the economic model they really kind of push the industrial and vocational education piece which is such a misrepresentation it is sheer propaganda because over and again if you go look at the charter or you go look at any records on tuskegee it is a school for teachers and it is a known fact that tuskegee produced more college educated blacks than it did manual laborers ever <laughs> Uh, however, um, and I, you wanted me to read quotes. I'll give you a little bit of a quote, which is controversial, even the fact that I used it in here from uh, Lewis, um, not Lewis, uh, Dixon, Thomas Dixon, right? The author of the uh, the um, Klansman, right? Which the birth of the nation is written on. But he hits it on the head with what Washington was doing. Washington was not sterile. He was not neutral. 
he he what he was doing was producing people who understood how to engage in nation building nation management and yes these skills coming out of enslavement where we were in all of these industries we had all of the know-how all of the skill sets to put this to use for ourselves would be very powerful both here but even more so on the continent and so this whole du bois washington conflict takes your eyes off the prize right and makes you negate the more viable model Nobody, I, see, Washington's position wasn't even to not advocate for political and social rights. Why? Because on many occasions, one, you hear in the Liberian crisis, he's talking about the black vote, right? But he was not advocating for this publicly. He was saying, control your own destiny right here and right now, first and foremost. Then worry about dealing with them. Secure yourself, okay? Secure yourself and your reality. Right. And so this is where the whole little saying that um, I repeated a couple of times and I, I even as a Tuskegee and I don't know where it came from. This whole concept of leave your underwear at home, we make our own at Tuskegee. Well, it was just saying that we produce everything that is a necessity of man, woman and child. OK. And there's great power in being able to feed yourself. I know some highbrow intellectuals think that that's uh, not respectable. But trust me, when uh, you're not eating and the person who produces their own food and, and can sustain herself is, then you get to see that you understand the difference. And that is what Washington is talking about, independence through industry, right? Own and operate your own industries and, and to your benefit. And then worry about social and political integration. But the truth of the matter is, is that having power of your own community and your own being able to control outcomes for yourself will obviously lead you to political power, okay? Political power, social uh, power, okay? And, and you really probably won't have to ask for it at that point. But the economic piece, which was viable, is undermined. It is eclipsed by this conversation around social and political rights and and neither, let's just be clear, neither program was adopted by us here, okay? The talented tenth don't go into high places and serve our people, okay? They become thoroughly co-opted. And this is why I always say black presence does not mean black progress, okay? Because the condition of the, the presence of African people in America in these white spaces is that they will not serve their people. And that is from any president in this country on down to any little politician in your community. Very often the condition of their position of constituted power is that they will not serve their people being African people or people who look like them in any real concrete or measurable way. And they know this, they're very clear on that too, which is why we are where we are, <laughs> right? In, in terms of the United States. The other part, okay, so I think, I don't know if I answered your question on STEM. So meaning like, yes, all of those STEM programs, science, agriculture, all the agricultural methods, okay? Um, small, you know, even even in terms of um, we think of agriculture, and the agricultural is just dealing with growing, you know, uh, you know, food and things of that nature. But we're also talking about animal, you know, having farms, animal product, you know, producing um, foods and services. We always make a joke at, or we used to make a joke at Tuskegee about the milk in the cafeteria being the milk from the milk bank, right? So livestock, small animal, large man, all those things. And as you know, that Tuskegee has one of the best uh, schools of veterinary, med veterinary medicine in the country, if not in the world. And we know that 75% of black veterinarians come from Tuskegee's school of veterinary medicine so anyway the point is is that yes we bought into the other program and we allowed washington's program to be uh, 
marginalized because of this imposed stigma, which really, I can't stress enough, was created by a small group of people. Du Bois admits he lied <laughs> in a essay on um, Washington that he writes. You have to get the book and, and look at it, but it's 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 an essay that's loosely titled My Personal Relations with Booker T. Washington. Uh, and he talks about the fact that he cites this programmatic difference as the impetus for their conflict, as opposed to talking about his real conflict with Washington, which was the Tuskegee machine. Washington's use of the Tuskegee machine in a way that silenced not only Du Bois, but other young leadership, if did they if they did not publicly espouse the line or the position that Washington uh, espoused, and, and it's important to say that what Washington is espousing in the public realm is not really truly him, right? Meaning that he is, for survival reasons, saying certain things, but we can qualify his actions, and he's doing something very very different at any given moment and and not randomly very strategically right say no i'm not giving asylum to this person or that person and then doing just that no i'm not advocating for civil rights and then doing funding just that okay no i'm not for voting uh i'm not concerned about voting but then using the black vote to people who know he's not advocating for the black vote as a as, as a wager in negotiations on an international case and threatening that whatever these officials do will be remembered by the African population within the United States. So listen, we're living in a different time. It's important that we don't talk about him in the context of these times, even though, listen, I have to say, the criticism that is leveled against Washington is usually leveled by people who if weighed and measured the same way, would be definitively cowards, okay? Because we have very few people who have done what he did in the same conditions. Do you get what I'm saying? We don't do most of what he did today, okay? For fear or for cowardice, but we don't do it. (laughs) Sorry. And 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 here here are the stories. That, thank you, really, really taking um, um me anyway, and and whoever's watching, I'm sure on the journey. And I, I can see, especially as you started off from when he started advocating for full ownership and control of of the, of the university and where he was in the township. I, I could see the advocacy and the the leadership skills uh, emanating probably from there early on in his career. And um, d- dare I say. Uh, again, you make the point that a lot of not a lot of people um, perform to his level and at, at such great risk and at such uh, expense um, that he he would have done in being uh, Pan African in that sense. Um, that sometimes I, it begs to wonder why um, he's not held in the same breath as a Kwame Nkrumah um, of, of his day. Yeah, uh, uh, so so it's uh, and not even held as a Pan Africanist period, which is why your, your book is so so interesting, because um, again, as you said, he's a forerunner be- um, to um, both uh, um, Nkrumah, Du Bois, really, and um, uh, Marcus, Garvey. Marcus, Marcus Garvey. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think this is important for our time because again, it shows a unabating, relentless, and fearless pers- uh, person in going about those activities and duties. And as you said, we, we need that today. Um, oh. but, African, but Africanism, from what I've seen, the, the distinctions I'm hearing, um, not to put anything down on Kwame Nkrumah and Cole, but um, it's been, the conversation I find is a bit one-sided. It's, it's only about unity. It, a lot of the conversation today about Pan-African, Pan-Africanism is about unity, unity, unity. That, that's all it's about. But what I hear from Booker T. Washington is a lot of practical application in what he's talking about and how an empowerment in building and, and ownership and, and being independent 
those are the other sides of the conversation that we don't hear enough. All we hear right. is about unity, unity, let's join hands. But join hands is not going to build anything what? necessarily. Right. And do what? What's next after joining hands? Right. That, so that, 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 that's a piece I think is should be emphasized a lot. Thank you. I hope that comes across in the book because that, that is exactly what it is. You know, there's many things going on in this book, but all along one concrete thing that is that Pan-Africanism is not meant to be just a feeling, but something that we can measure. The benefits are measurable, right? So it's not enough to have this rhetoric, like, yeah, I identify with that African person here and there. Okay, now what? And, and certainly not for a people who in the world need so much, okay, have suffered so much have endured so much and i you know all we can think of to do for ourselves is feel good that we all identify with each other are you serious we've got to get some of those needs met and and let's talk about the instances where someone does those things meets some of our needs in measurable ways i Side note, I taught a course I mentioned on um, Pan-Africanism, an international course with over 100 students on the continent. Um, and I did it in this time, meaning virtually. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and that was, you know, we used a couple of chapters from this book, but we also used um, all of the foundational stuff. And, that, and, and, and this is not to take away from Du Bois because one, one of the things that I talk about in there the whole course was taught in the fashion of, in theory, the theoretical lines of Pan-Africanism, Washington, Du Bois, um, Garvey, uh, later on in Kruma, and you know, all of that, what that was theoretically, and then what it was in practice, and mm. what it produced for us, right? What did yeah. it produce for us? So no one is going to take anything away from Du Bois. His brand of Pan-Africanism that is born out of coming, him being one of the participants of the first Pan-African conference and then going on to be the initiator of the Pan-African congresses that produces a series of congresses that would be the setting for the creation of the OAU, right? The Organization of African Unity, which is the present day AU. And, and we need to, you know, in this conversation, theory and practice, we need to be pressing the AU about more concrete things, right? Not saying nothing has been done because I've definitely been uh, tracking and have been a part of an AU function that was too you know, uh, implement or to get recommendations for implementation towards a implementing a unified Africa. However, we have to still stay on the mark about what these measurable results are. And so Du Bois gave a great gift, gift to Africa. He creates the context through which all of these conversations and, and certainly the most important Congress, the Fifth Pan-African Congress, where the call for uh, continental independence and liberation, right, is asserted. And we see numerous African countries gain their liberation, but you know, if, if it were a think tank, so be it, uh, this would be the stage where that consciousness is raised, right? Amongst the leadership of Africa, very important, right? But still something different than what Washington did. Still something very different than what Garvey does. Right, and Garvey plays a, a significant role in, in Pan-Africanism in the world. Unfortunately, he does not, uh, it's not sustainable long-term, right? Because what he mm. is trying to do is replicate, and he admits this, if you read the chapter on, um, not even admits this, he uh, divulges this, that he modeled the UNIA after the Tuskegee model, okay? Uh, and he sends Washington a pamphlet and says, yeah, I've modeled the UNIA after this, after Tuskegee. And I want to come to Tuskegee and Washington invites him. And then this is how 
his sole purpose for coming to the United States is to United States is to see Tuskegee, right? But he arrives four months after Washington died. And just side note, it is Washington in every way who is responsible for Marcus Garvey being in this country. Because had Washington failed to defeat the African exclusion measure in January of 1915, in March of 1916, Garvey coming from Jamaica, who was got notable mention on the floor of the House of Representatives in that epic debate around the African exclusion measure, had he failed to defeat that measure, Garvey would have been locked out and unable to enter the United States and make his way to Harlem where he is able to you know establish the biggest the largest organization of the African world ever right uh in our history right past present ever right and so that's that's an important thing I want to um get to your comment Rudy about uh Togo and the vault culture um important thing you know because you also sent me a a, a student a, a thesis right about uh tuskegee and colonialism and and i would say interesting but it's unfortunate in the sense that i, I think that's a little bit of the misguided propaganda that's out there meaning tuskegee is not involved in colonizing anything <laughs> okay uh Tuskegee is a school <laughs> and um, that was a sustainable community, but it certainly was not a co colonizing force and they are not involved in the colonization of the Togo. What Tuskegee is, uh, is at that moment in time is the institution whose methods, agricultural methods around cotton production are invoked and, uh, and co-opted by the German colonial regime. And it's important to understand that the moment that this happens, and, and this has to do with the title of the book, the moment that this happens, that Washington is um, uh, co-opted by the Germans, he is like any person who is uneducated about the reality on the ground in Africa. I spend all of chapter four talking about um, uh, Washington's relationships with uh, African nationalists and uh, and various situations on the continent of Africa and his position on colonialism, right? And his position on uh, the abuses going on in the Congo Free State. Uh, under King Leopold and all of those things, the use of Christianity as a tool of colonization. That happens after those incidents and all those scenarios are, some are going on simultaneously while the Togo expedition is happening. Some are happening afterwards, right? But he's sort of getting a crash course in understanding Africa and the condition on the ground for African people under colonialism and imperialism on the continent. The Togo expedition is simply this, a moment where, a tragic moment, where he gives a very hard lesson and understanding that no, uh, being involved in Africa isn't enough, right? He is secretly, and I'm critical of Washington, if you see the language I use in there, uh, I'm critical of him. He's overzealous, he's eager, he has a personal desire to get on the African continent and, and, and do something with Africa. He's not a religious person, but he only knows missionaries to have been in Africa. He's critical of them in his own words, you see that, because he criticizes Christianity in South Africa, all over Africa. Okay, as a vehicle of spreading colonial domination. However, he um, he does not understand, right? And I'm clear that he doesn't see because you can see from his personal correspondence that he doesn't get it. He gets this opportunity to export Tuskegee methods, and his primary way of doing so is through his graduates, his graduates his 
international students who return to their home and other people who adopt the model. And so this is his first opportunity that he gets to put his graduates on the ground who are trained in these methods on in Africa. So they're trained in cotton production and they get an invitation to do this in Togo. This is happening simultaneously in 1900, around 1900, where he, he is engaging in the plenary sessions for the first Pan-African Conference, right? It's different. Conference, which is only one. And then the Congresses are initiated by Du Bois and no one who was at the conference in 1900 is at the Congress in 1919. They are all dead. Du Bois is the sole survivor, right? So Washington in 1900 is approached by the Germans. He agrees. I think he does it very quickly. Like I said, he's overzealous. He knows he's never going to do it himself. He's living by vicariously through his graduates. He goes for it, and he does not qualify. It is um, a tragedy of unbelievable proportions. Because if you send, if everyone you send someplace dies. That's a failure. I don't care how much cotton you produce, right? And any strides made in the area of cotton production that they share would have been to the credit of the German colonial regime or forces anyway, right? It would not have been a credit to Tuskegee. It wouldn't have been done anything for Tuskegee, okay? So once again, qualifying the, the circumstances, he learns that, okay? Both culture is the culture that the German colonial regime wanted to implement. And then what it was, was an oppressive colonial culture. Their desire was to recreate the colonial South. So to recreate colonial America, American South, Southern plantation, oppressive life and circumstances and conditions and impose that on the indigenous Togolese people under the context of cotton production, right? With the expertise of Tuskegee graduates implementing their methods. That's simply what it was. I think there's some work to be done around what these graduates were saying about what the Germans were doing there was violence on the ground. It wasn't a pretty thing. Um, all the graduates die. See, they, they apparently die of illnesses related to um, malaria and things of that nature. Um, they're, they're not prepared for the environment. But then the final uh, individual who establishes a um, Tuskegee Light School, an industrial school, he survives only long enough to establish the school and then he drowns in a river, crossing a river. So uh, that's the end of that. However, unfortunately, when people are writing and rewriting this history from a Western perspective, they love to reference the Togo expedition as an intersection uh, of uh, European imperialist, American, uh, cult, American colonial, you know, colonial American culture and, and slave enslavement culture, um, and 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 then Tuskegee, you know, as if Tuskegee is aligned with either of them. It's not, and um, it was Tuskegee methods, right? Because we know that the cotton production in the South. American cotton, as produced by enslaved Africans, was coveted around the world at this period, right? Even supposedly the Pope wanted to have cotton produced in South Carolina or something to that effect, you know? So, uh, but the culture that the Germans wanted to implement, they wanted to, um, so this idea of the Negro, creating the Negro, the Negro is not a real, uh, thing. It is a construction, right, that is imposed on African people, right? That's the theme in Roots, 
right? He says he's Kuta Kente, and they say, no, you're Toby, okay? So the, the Negroization of African people, I don't want to say the other word, but <laughs> so that is what they're attempting to do to create the Negro in the Togolese context amongst the indigenous Togolese person, create that, impose that as a result of creating conditions that are similar to slave, the, the institution of slavery in America and the conditions under which Africans produced cotton in America. Um, it's very, it's, 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 it's very, um, it's very, uh, how would you say, it's typical imperialism, abusive, you know, uh, demeaning, all of that. The reason why this is talked about, though, is, is because this is from a Western perspective, okay? How they once again use us and our methods and our ingenuity to do something on the continent of Africa. This is not Pan-Africanism. And we need to say this every time this case comes up, okay? Because there is a book written by Zimmerman, um, Alabama and Africa, specifically about this. And Zimmerman got a lot more funding and all of this backing, and the book is out there. And, and this is only a moment in the history of Tuskegee's role in Washington's engagement with Africa, okay? Matter of fact, it is the definitive turning point, okay? Because it destroys him. He is very depressed. <laughs> he can't get anybody to go to Africa after this. He's, he's, and he's tied. I urge you all, if you're interested in watching that at all, to read the story of the Negro, the rise of the race from slavery. It, you know, it really tells you who he is. Um, but he's invested in Africa. He sees himself as an African person, which is why you don't hear him, even though he is sired by some unknown white male. You don't hear him talking about European ancestry in the way that you hear Du Bois talking about his, right? Uh, so he's invested in Africa. And for this, this situation dashes all his hopes and dreams. He comes, he brings it back front and center, regroups and repositions himself. And this is why you see the other cases happened so swiftly, even the African exclusion measure. He's not confused about whether he's an African. He's not confused about who is an African. He's not confused how he's got to negotiate and who's be happy he has to negotiate on and what position he has to take, right? This is why I can say, pull every string possible. Like, I don't care what you do up there. You get it done to defeat the African exclusion measure. He didn't just figure all of that out in a week. He was already aware of it because of dark moments like this in the Togo situation, which were catastrophic. And even in the um, the Liberian crisis, he's not confused. This is why he can drudge through that case, which is a long, you know, this is a test of endurance for him as a negotiator on part of African people. He can lose his way, but he's not willing to let these white guys derail his plans to secure the one of only two independent African nations on the continent of Africa. He's not willing to do that. He didn't care if Taft or Roosevelt in office. He's like, we're still going to negotiate and get this done. And in the end, he has the inside conversation with African people on the continent who are American Liberian, but he's not even confused about how to speak to them which is that, hey, you are an African. Sure, you will have a right to be repatriated and returned to the continent of Africa, but don't think that that means you have a right to institutionalize some of the same unprincipled, uh, destructive, racist, and bizarre practices that an imperial nation or colonizer would impose on them or that people who enslaved you imposed on you in America. So he figures all of these things out in the context of the Togo um, experience. And you see him clearly reposition himself when given the opportunity to engage in something that looks like a colonial project in the Sudan. He tells this venture capitalist in, uh, who, from America who is in Sudan, hey, I'm not interested 
in colonizing the Negro. Because he says, you know, I, I'm going to colonize the Negro in Sudan. And he lets him know, no, 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 no. I'm not interested in colonizing the Negro. Like, good luck to you. But I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in colonizing the Negro anyway. Right? But go ahead. Do whatever you're doing, but you will get no assistance from me. And there would be Tuskegee graduates who are in the area engaging in um, projects there. I talk about that, but it's not the same thing as the Togo. And 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 they are also aware of, of the uh, commitment they have to have to not engaging uh, African people from the same position as uh, imperialist nations are engaging African people being oppressive. You know, it's like they figured it out. You know, so I don't know. I hope I answered that. I could go on all day, but I hope I answered some of that because that is, you know, unfortunately, one of the things that gets out there about Tuskegee and about Washington. And for people who are uninformed of the facts, they use that as a way to say, um, you know, this was uh, Washington advancing the U.S. agenda, you know, or white American posture or european posture or western posture and that really simply is not true and so we got to be careful that is a, like a hijacking of once again so if if the du bois washington conflict is a hijacking of the tuskegee model to get you to move away from the tuskegee model and go towards something else this whole conversation around the togo being a you know unique uh cotton production exp expedition or experiment uh, that was to the benefit of the, the uh, Germans, that's another way too to get you to go in that direction and not understand that really Washington was up to something very different and far more meaningful in respect and regard to Africa. I, 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 um, th th thank you very much for that, Dr. Wright. I think uh, you could just got like a c couple more questions. Um, okay. In, in, in a uh, when when you speak when you when you spoke about the seminar you had with students i think you said uh, mm -hmm. on online and some of them from 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 the continent of africa right. what, 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 what 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 is their reaction and the response to some of these the things you say oh, to them it was great it was um they were surprised because they had only heard of like the boys right um, i only used a couple of chapters from this book because I wasn't doing a, a, a course on the book, but I was using the, you know, I used a lot of text, uh, um, large text, put it this way, critical pieces, right? So the sessions from the, uh, the, the um, resolutions from the first Pan-African Conference, the resolutions from the, uh, the Congresses, you know, all of these various declarations, pieces from Du Bois, Nkrumah, uh, um, um, all the way up to, you know, people like Emil Kyle Cabral, all of these the in, in independent struggles and what that meant, right? Because you're talking about measurable results for uh, in terms of Pan-Africanism. But they were really impressed up and to know that, you know, that back 100 plus years ago, now 105 years ago, particularly with the African exclusion measure, that you had uh african people in america who had a position right and took a position against the u.s government okay because that is what that is right mm. uh african people within advocating for african people internationally you know and 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 i had to stress that part of my personal uh motivations for not just writing the case because it's the truth, right? You know, and, and the evidence is there and it should be uh, noted. But we have, you know, we have to take note of the position we need to have. How do we relate to African people internationally? So if, I don't know, if the UK says Africans from America can't come here, I expect you to advocate for me to say that I can come there, <laughs> okay? And connect with you. I, I, if, if, if some country in uh, Central or South America says, you know, lock all Africans from America out because they're to this, that, and the other, I expect those Africans there to advocate for me, okay? And, and I expect that 
you shouldn't mind that I should be able to benefit from coming there to connect with you or getting or benefiting from whatever you have established there. Because certainly at this moment in time with the African exclusion measure in 1915, Washington, who has a school, his whole purpose of fighting something like the African exclusion measure is because he does not want his students from Africa to be turned away. He wants them to come and get this education. He wants them to come and get something that's beneficial to their people. And he wants, he believes in the right of return, not just for the international student coming from Africa or the Caribbean situation, but for the African student who coming from within the United States. There's a Tuskegee mission where you must return to your community and implement these practices, right? So it's not taken lightly. It is, there's a sacred mission intertwined with the whole thing because early on, the students are not paying tuition. This institution is truly sustainable by a labor force that's provided by the students. So, you know, I, you know, I was very clear in use of the chapters that are in this book to the students in this international Pan-African course to establish and show them that we are okay with each other benefiting from what our ancestors have done in any of these locales. Do you get what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. Pan-Africanism, as you said, should have some measure, should yeah, have yeah. some benefits, right? We yeah. shouldn't only just be bound by unity to fight our oppression, but we should yeah. also have, um, a philosophy connected, an ideology, uh, Pan-Africanism as an ideology that in practice, there should be something we get from our unity, not just throwing off of oppression, not just fighting oppression, but something that are measures, measurable gains that we can share with each other. And so Washington was not hiding that he wanted those his students from the African continent and everywhere else. And side note, I said this to Baruti, the only people who thank him are his students from the continent of Africa as a group, okay? Because they're aware of his direct challenge to this measure. So they thank him. Uh, all of them should have thanked him, but the point is, is that they knew uh, that they were close to his heart in his efforts to do this, right? But my students um, in that uh, course, what what it did for them, you know, and it was really, uh, a, you know, for me, I, I was just thrilled because, yes, I'm in the classroom. But I think when you get a chance to teach so many African people all at one time about something they thought was just a theory, but now we are focusing it on practice, right? How do you now use your power in your locale to the benefit of African people, right? That, that becomes a challenge for them because they were students, but they all had professional capacities too. Some of them are um, already in their careers, right? So when I say students, students of this course on Pan-Africanism, but not necessarily still uh, matriculating students. Some of them yeah. are yeah. more professional. Yeah. Yeah, they call them mature students. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So some of them are traditional students who are in school. Some of them are already professionals and, and, and in their careers. But my point was that, you know, it challenged them by example. Here are cases to show how we advocated for African people globally. This is how you can do it. Now you've got to uh, mold it to your context and say whatever it is that you value and whatever it is you are in the profession or whatever your skill sets, how do you lend those to the benefit of African people? And that's gonna be different and unique for everyone, but it was a very good, um, the book was a very good example because it's not just about feelings, right? There are measurable results. That 1915 uh, uh, amendment to the larger con uh, immigration act uh, still stands today. It would be coupled in uh, 1965 with an immigration act that is connected to 
uh, the uh, 1964, 1965 Civil Rights Acts uh, that cover African immigration again, once again, and, and stay tuned, I'll write something about that. However, it still stands. Had that measure passed, the doors would have been locked. Our own communities would have been different, right? Hmm. Malcolm X, we went and had a Malcolm X because his mother's people are from the Caribbean. We went and had a Marcus Garvey. We certainly wouldn't have had a Barack Obama, if that matters or not. I don't know. But the point is, is that he would have been in America <laughs> because his father would have been locked out. OK, he wouldn't have to come to the United States to do anything. I mean, on and on and on. There would have been no Harry Belafonte. There would have been no, uh, you know, just numerous people who are come to the American context and contribute to our communities, to our struggle to our you know struggle for liberation here but also who contribute to developing the world no Nkrumah would have come to lincoln university and engaged africa no fella would have come to the united states and engaged africans here and and established the genre of afrobeat and and its political nature so we could go on and on and on you know like so that still stands, the, the, the measurable results, right? And for whatever it's worth, listen, there are some things to get from America because there have been some strides that African people have made here, right? Um, none of them were given. They were all fought for, okay? And, and I, as an African person and as an, a woman, Every, even all my freedoms, my daily freedoms were given to me by African people. Not, and, and, I, and I could mark that in a, you know, very clear way. They have not been given to me by this country. They've been given to me by my African ancestors, right? Uh, specifically, every stroke of it. So it is okay for us to say that and say that we want to share that and that it not only does something for us, but it propels our family, our African people globally to a different place, to a different level. That should be the point of it all, right? In chapter four, I talk about that because it's not a one-way street, right? It's not a one-way street. Washington is able to do what he's doing for African people in the Liberian crisis and the African exclusion measure because he is talking to and learning from Africans on the continent. He's learning from them. He, has, he can't turn on the TV and find out what's happening in Africa. And, and there is no such thing at that moment in time, right? Mm. He is learning. There is an exchange. We always had a dialectical relationship with each other from the continent to the Caribbean, to the US. We are in a constant conversation with each other that fosters growth and transformation that quickens our consciousness so that we are able to act at the designated moment and, and an appointed time, okay? So his consciousness that ends up being to the benefit of Africans on the continent also comes from them as well. Okay, and that shouldn't be taken lightly. That is the point, whole point of the chapter that I uh, write about Booker T. Washington and his African Africa and his African nationalist affiliates. Okay, I certainly downplay the Togo, but I give the facts and I and I and I embellish in detail, not with my words, with the actual words from the correspondence between Washington and you know, Duze Muhammad Ali, right? The Egyptian born, uh, Egyptian born, but Nigeria uh, resident at the time who was producing the African Times and Orient Review. He is in a conversation with Washington and he is also in a conversation with Garvey. He's selling Garvey's paper in Nigeria, even though he has his own paper too, right? And they are in these dialectical conversations about the struggle of African people globally, right? Uh, so he's, Washington is talking to African nationalists who are founding members of the ANC, good, bad, or indifferent. He's talking to you know people in Malawi. He's talking to people in uh, Liberia, of course, 
and scattered all over the continent and they are fostering a consciousness in him that he does not have right and it allows him at an appointed time to act not only on behalf of Africans in America, but on behalf of Africans internationally. So he's getting just as much of an education as they are from him, right? Everybody's thinking this big, world-renowned, you know, Washington, everybody knows him, da-da-da. No, they are schooling him. And so I had to, you know, stress that in this course, that when we engage even in this course, even though I am leading the course, uh, I'm the theoretician leading the course, I am actually engaging you in that same dialectical way and exchange that we have always engaged each other in the context of our struggle and our challenges, right? Because we have so many similarities in terms of our internal conflicts, and and the constant pressure that we have in relationship to what happened in colonialism and post-colonialism neo-colonialism right mm -hmm. so neo, even the neo-colonial condition in africa is not that much unlike what we experience here right we have black leadership in america but yes if we qualify them if we qualify that black leadership, we know that they are they just appear black. Once again, black presence does not mean black progress. Do they serve us in measurable ways? So that was the you know the vein in which I taught the course and how the book was used and how we always have to come right back down to qualifying, right? What Pan Africanism is for us, and there should be measurable results. We can have a good time and feel good and identify with each other, but we need to get the business because there's so much that we need, right? So we need yeah. to do. Dr. Wright, mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to just say thank you very much for that. I wanted to say okay. the continuance of what you were saying, uh, since Namdi and Ego are of uh, Nigerian background, mm -hmm. it's, it's fair to say <laughs> that there would have been no Namdi Azikwe. That's right. Uh, first That's president of Nigeria, right. Right. who actually studied at Lincoln University, Lincoln University. In Nigeria, uh, who studied obviously way after the um, African Exclusion Act was not right. passed. Right. Uh, he would not have been there. Now, um, Ego, let me just, if I could, if I could just um, sort of um, put a thought in your head if you weren't already going to do this to uh, to prompt Dr. Wright about the issue of the uh, the third reconstruction uh, of the United States, and then if you if you would do that, I as she's just kind of saying a few words about that, I might have um, a question or a comment that sort of parallels that that slant. Oh well, well, well I I I. Um... I, you know, you, you, you can go ahead because I've I, I, I finished with, with my questions that I, I wanted to get across. Okay. But, but yes, yeah, please, please do go ahead um, with, with that. Okay. Okay. I will. Thank you. So, Dr. Wright, as you can Thank see, you. Our, our title for the show was The Mind of Booker T. Washington on Africa and the Third Reconstruction of the United States. Right. Right. So I remember when you and I, prior to much earlier, prior to the, the show here, um, I mentioned the third reconstruction. Right, right. And you right. said, oh, did you mean the second reconstruction? Right. And so we were talking about the issue of the so-called first reconstruction being 1865 to 1877 right. and then i'm talking about perhaps a second reconstruction as though we were talking about say the the lyndon johnson era right. and so i said a third reconstruction because as you correctly assumed yes i was talking about a first reconstruction 1865 to 1877 I'm talking about a second reconstruction 
of the uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, years in which we were talking about affirmative action, greater voting rights, uh, the fair housing issues, other kinds of amenities that seems like it was about including African people in the United States uh, and in some ways making repairs. However, in today's era, uh, post the George Floyd murder and the subsequent uh, fallout of protests around that, some people have talked about this being the time of a third reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're mentioning third reconstruction uh, with some examples such as um, the NFL uh, playing the uh, Lift Their Voice and Sing for the first game of the season for- Oh, they did that? Teams. That happened? Oh, also, that. well, supposedly they're going to do that. Oh, and, uh, Amazon, and for example, uh, NASCAR taking down the Confederate flags at the games or uh, these various racist statues, Confederate statues coming down. I also wanted to point out, I'm um, reading from a, a newspaper article right here, the, uh, the CEO of Netflix donates $120 million to uh, historically black colleges. I'm reading here where they're pointing out that uh, Reed Hastings and his wife, Patty Quinlan of Netflix are gonna give $40 million uh, to each of these three institutions, the United Negro College Fund, Spelman College and Morehouse College along with some other things that's happening such as, for example, YouTube even has pledged a hundred million dollars to help black artists and other creators, just to name a few. So given the so-called idea about this being a, a third reconstruction, when I mentioned that as though we're gonna get reparations, so we're gonna get some permanency of fair treatment, in, in reaction to that, you, you said here, and I'm just quoting from some of your, your comments, uh, you said, for example, you said the civil rights movement, for example, is built up to be a climax in our history. However, it was not. And you go on to say it was a low point, a period when we gave up everything that was truly ours for integration. You said huge mistake. You said Booker T. Washington, and I'm underlining Bush, Booker T. Washington certainly would not have, would not have encouraged integration with America, as you say, and would have endorsed strengthening our ties with Africa for sure. So uh, given this idea about this third reconstruction, does this represent uh, actual golden bananas or simply sunlit straw? <laughs> As we as we come upon it, what would be your your thoughts uh, briefly on that, and also in context to your your statements that you're going to give, what is it that we lost, as you said, in integration that we had before that was meaningful for us? Well, okay, so. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, reciting the, uh, my statement. So let me just begin with this. I think that, yes, the way, you know, I teach history. And uh, I'm, this is for public consumption. So, you know, there's the inside and the outside conversation. But the point is, is that I think that the way American history has been taught has been problematic in terms of, you know, just in much in the same way where someone teaching American history will start the history of African people with enslavement. Very problematic. Uh, so very often social and political history are taught in the sense that we, we start with the civil rights movement, like as this great high point that we need to return to. Um, you know, yeah, the, the civil rights movement, uh, civil rights movement um, did what it did. Okay, it challenged uh, 
segregation laws in the United States. Um, but we also, it's amazing because I, I, I would love to go back and interview some of the people who were living in the South at that moment in time uh, and are willing and transparent enough to recall the fact that they did not support uh, King and his efforts to desegregate various places. And part of the reason why was because, let's just very be very honest, um, Martin Luther King um, and the people who are working with him are in the minority in terms of the sentiment of African people in this country at that time. America was violent then. America is still very violent. America has always been violent. It, America was founded on violence, systemic violence, and uh, a, you know, very methodical, organized violence. Black people who lived in the South knew that most of all, okay? Uh, they could see what was happening when people attempted to desegregate schools. They could see, I just finished watching something recently and when they were showing this one young lady who integrated, and, and I'm sorry, it escapes me at the moment, but she integrated a Southern school and she's only 15 and they were interviewing her. And, and one of the commentators said, I wish somebody had, had have been there with her right? When she went to integrate the, integrate the school. Sure, she had some kind of level of security, but you're talking about people who would spit on a child. You're talking about people who were actively engaged in lynching Black people, who are actively engaged in killing Black people. You know, uh, nobody went to jail for Emmett Till or any of the Emmett Tills that are unknown, okay? Because the, even then, after the turn of the century, it's not seen as a crime to murder an African person in the United States. And we're still wondering whether or not it's seen as a crime to murder an African person in the United States today. Okay, I mean, Breonna Taylor, right? We, we, we keep saying her name because we know that state sanctioned violence and even violence um, by on the part of white civilians is permissible in American society historically, not just today. We, not, we can't pretend like it just began today. This is a history and it is unfortunately part of the legacy of this country, a deep um, burning level of violence, right? Even when we talk about Martin Luther King, you know, people want to talk about King. Oh, King was a champion, uh, 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 a champion of peace, right? But America murdered him like anyone else, okay, that they murdered before. They murdered him very violently. He had a very violent death. And some are alluding to the fact that it was even more violent than we think it was, you know, by being, you know, uh, shot. So my point is, is that no, the, the average black person and living in a black community felt very safe in a black community with their children going to schools with black teachers. We know this even after reconstruction, there's not a push for black children to go to white schools in other places post reconstruction, during reconstruction, because their parents did not feel like they would be treated equally or they'd be treated well, okay? So as for integration, we gave up our professional class patronizing our professional class to patronize white America, okay? So we start to, we no longer support the businesses in our community. In our community, they're all black businesses. Sure, they're white businesses too, but black people have businesses in black community. I have some family members who have businesses in black communities in the South, right? And we could do that. We can patronize our own. Now our money is going around and around in our community. Now our money does comes home with you and leaves it the same night, as soon as you go to the store, because everybody else has a business in our community, but we can't have a business in our community. 
and we can't have a business in any of those other groups community that have a business in our community right be it asians or middle easterners whoever it is or white americans okay there's a condition we can't have a business in their communities and they have all of the businesses are, are in our communities are theirs and so our communities are much like the african continent they are extraction sites right and that's what malcolm x was talking about uh in regard in adam clayton powell in regard to uh 120 fish street right for a long time on 120 fish street in harlem these businesses existed there white owned business of whatever various cultures they had businesses in the heart of harlem where you had a huge African population from all around the world. The people could buy, but we couldn't have jobs there. Why? Right? So that is an extraction site. It was Adam Clayton Powell and Malcolm X said, listen, if our people can't have jobs in these businesses, then you're not going to eat here. You cannot have your business in our community. Okay? And they made that clear. You will not be in our community using our communities as extraction sites. Well, on the larger scale, that is what uh, in integration uh, has done. It has taken black dollars out of black communities and put them into white and other businesses. And meanwhile, black communities don't have bad businesses. Right. And, and we know that about, you know, business loans. Black people are marginalized home ownership, the redlining, all of that. We know how systemic racism has played a role in African people in America establishing wealth, be it through a business or home ownership, right? So now you also have a situation for us where our professional class, which could count on black patronage, now has to compete for black patronage with white professional classes and others right meaning doctors lawyers uh educators who are establishing institutions all of that you know if you want to really know how deep the uh white american liberal goes ask them who's their doctor who's their lawyer who's their dentist right i bet you and tell them don't whip out that phone you need to know who it is off the bat meaning don't make it up that that they're black because if you're not going to a black lawyer a black doctor a black dentist right for the women you know let's keep it real a black oh like obgyn you know if you're as a black person who patronizes them if you're not going to them and for white individuals who, who claim to have integrated their dollars, okay, do you support our black professional class? No, absolutely not. I don't know. I know some white Americans, so-called white Americans, who say they have black family doctors, but they can't tell me who that black family doctor is off the bat. <laughs> so that leads me to believe they don't have a black family doctor. My point is simply this. Black people in america african people in america integrated into their money economically integrated into america okay but white america did not integrate with us okay even further on the integration point america in terms of residential communities today is not integrated okay in america residential communities if you look to your left if you look to your right your neighbors look like you okay now we have a place i come or i'm originally from new york and in new york you know everybody plays that game that you know hey new york is so diverse but if you go when you go back to your community you better believe when you look left you look right your neighbors look like you. Sure, we all come into common spaces in New York City and work at other common spaces, Brooklyn now, which is New Manhattan, and work. But your neighbors aren't the other people, whoever the other people are, okay? Because residential communities in America are not integrated. And today, in a place like New York, 
you could still wander into some neighborhoods as an African person, as a black person, and not make it out of there. Okay? Not survive it. We know that for a fact. We got Yousef Hawkins, you, you name it, okay? That can still happen in 2020. It is very clear, okay? So that can't integration, when did it happen, okay? What it did was it took our money and our ingenuity and our uh, intellectual property and everything and it integrated into America with no benefit to us, right? Only individual benefits to some extent, right? Where we're useful to them, but it didn't really. So we give that to students in schools as a high point. That is not a high point. That is not a high point. Our high point really as African people in America came right after the Civil War during Reconstruction. And once again, very violent time. But when is America not exceptionally violent? I think, you know, because we're having a real conversation here. It is really delusional to think that a country that is founded off of systematic violence is ever not violent. Right, the, the, it, it is it's violent then, it's still violent, and, and the ways in which this violence is expressed varies, okay? Right, so in, in various industries. But that being said, yes, the moment where we are having our high point is reconstruction, post-reconstruction, that first 12, and I would argue even first 50 years out of enslavement, we have black, one of the things I'm researching now are independent black industrial sustainable communities in the United States. I talk, I do the book and I talk about Tuskegee as a model because it's one of many and it's unique because it masquerades as a school and it is a school, but it's more than a school, right? But there are many of these communities, many of them. What happens to them? Huh, they're, you know, it's destroyed, they're destroyed by violence. Okay, but why put it this way? We are always in this constant uh, problem solving mode where we're trying to figure out our, our situation in the United States. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that we did it. We did it already. We did it many times over and again. And it was so sharp, quick, effective, that it angered, that it incited uh, white America. And it, 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 it made them afraid too. And what do violent people do when they're afraid? They commit more violence. Uh, you know, listen, so what happened to those communities, right? The most famous of them we know is the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma. But that was not the only one, there were many like that and the story for them is same as the story for Tulsa Oklahoma many of them are burnt to the ground the people are murdered and then in the cases where there's not open violence that ends them there is policies put in place to destroy them to take land back from African people over and over again in this country. We even have things going on, you know, the land loss on, in terms of the black community, the amount of community, uh, amount of African people in this country who come into the 20th century with land and lose land over the 20th century is astronomical, right? The reversal of um, things, policies that allowed for land for the African population. And we must understand that there was amazing land grants given to uh, European immigrants to this country. And, and in the moment, for example, even the whole 40 acres in the mule situation as a result of Field Order 15, okay? And um, Sherman's army, even the land that was given to Africans as a result of that massacre where the Confederate army catches, you know, uh, a large number of African people, freedmen following Sherman's army and massacres them crossing a footbridge. 
that's where the 40 acres in the mule comes out of that field order 15 by uh, um, Sherman. That is reversed. Okay, that is reversed shortly thereafter. So all of these things, you know, let me stress this. One of the things that I teach is that all we need to do is go back and study our independent industrial black communities and we'll see the progress made. Not even that, This I'm not saying anything that white Americans who have been partially honest have said, meaning in that famous debate on the floor of the house in 1915 around the African exclusion measure, a white congressman argues that the African story in America is an epic story, okay? There has been no group of people in the history of the world who have suffered 250 years of enslavement under chattel slavery okay, where you're the equivalent of an object, surviving, defeat this institution in a capitalist society and came out swinging, okay, like we did in the first 50 years. The progress, even if you want to reduce it to someone like Du Bois, look at that, or even reduce it to someone like Washington. Both of them are unusual constructions in the context of the history of African people in this country, right? Washington coming out of enslavement, 50 years out of it, building such an institution and doing all the things that we're talking about here, right? Unbelievable. I personally, I'd be shocked too. Like these people don't have no residual of that. But then even if you're talking about people who go the other route, uh, uh, Du Bois, 250 years of enslavement, they come out and, and you are astute. You have the caliber of people who can go to a Harvard and compete with them. White Americans who have not had 250 years of enslavement. In that short amount of time, you have huge progress, material progress, institutional progress, organizational progress, okay? And it scares the hell out of white Americans. And their promise to us is that never again, never again, you will never be able to do that again. You know, and, and I and I, I feel sorry very often for people who try to rationalize um, our problem here in the sense that in the United States specifically, in the sense that we just must not have thought of this thing. We just must not have figured out the code to unlock our oppression. No, not at all. We figured it out. It's been figured it out. Not only figured it out, but we did it. Okay? And so all the cre all the circumstances, policies have been put in place to roll back that progress and make it impossible to recreate again. And this is this is with policy, right? Uh, so it's not a mystery, but if we teach the story, and it's very dangerous, teach the narrative that our high point is when we gave up all of the autonomy in our community. That's sad. No, we didn't. We, we come out establishing communities that are as much as possible under our control. And, we, and, and guess who we are? We don't come out of enslavement dumb. We have all the skills. It makes perfect sense. We have all the skills in every industry you can think of because we were exploited in every industry that existed in America. And so now we put these skills to use for ourselves, right? But if you erase that history and you begin it at civil rights movement, and that's the high point. Really? What is the high point? Okay, if we look at, let's qualify that high point. Now we have Black people in positions of power whose condition for their presence in those positions of power is that they don't serve us. Now what? Mm -hmm. Right? Because there is no community. 
right? There is no community to serve. We've been erased in that sense, right? So there is no service to us. Okay, some of the policy mechanisms that have been put in place, affirmative action in a racist country like America, once affirmative action is put into practice, who benefits from affirmative action most of all? White women. Oh, go figure. The very mechanism that was created to undo systemic racism in institutions is in effect racist in and of itself. The no brainer there. Okay, so that is not our high point where we allow white supremacy to morph itself in terms of policies and institutions, pull us physically out of our community in terms of our economic um, viability, right? So we're coming out of our communities and supporting all these big corporations and institutions spending money, right? But they put nothing back in our community. So we open up our communities to be extraction sites. You know, yes, legal segre segregation had to end. Fine, that's great. But I uh, wouldn't say that that's a high point. It is not a high point. And if we weigh and measure it, what we had then and what we have now, you will see that materially, and in reality, in terms of social reality, it wasn't a high point because when we talk about if we qualified it, not even materially, but in terms of the, the value of our lives, right? We, we still at ground zero here, right? Which is why, if you notice, even in the course of this dialogue, I'm very careful to say, you know, I, I do not use the term African-American. Um, because we are Africans in America. Uh, we have, we fought a war that allowed for us to have policies, reconstruction policies, which we shouldn't be confused about those either because reconstruction, 13, 14, 15th amendments, particularly the 13, 14th and the 15th amendment were reconstruction policies, but they were a political strategy for the Republican Party to flip the African population in the South and give theirself a political boom to their benefits so that the head count in the South of African people would not be a political boom to the Southern states, right? Meaning your congressman represents the population, right? And so you get to get a head count, right? So now you want all those people that benefited from the Emancipation Proclamation to now vote in favor of the party that in essence, theoretically freed them. But that freedom too was a military strategy, right? But we took our freedom. That's the truth of it. I don't want to get too deep in all of the historical or whatever. So people get confused. But my point is simply that, you know, we have to be very clear about the fact that today, our very persons, our very lives is something that we're in a death lock of a struggle around still, okay? So, it, you know, it's nothing to say 100 years ago you could kill an African person and get away with it. Today, you can kill an African person and very likely get away with it. Um, so we are still at ground zero in terms of the value of our lives, and, and we can't ignore that. Um, and, and it's delusional to do that. And so when we look at all these laws on the books, you know, and, and, and a side note, I just have to say, and I know maybe people might not like this in the United States mostly, but this is part of the reason why I don't talk about, you know, the election of, of, of Barack Obama as a victory for African people in this country, because that's a perfect example. It changed nothing in respect to the value of our lives. Okay, perfect example. You, everybody, you all, those of you who are outside the United States, you just saw uh, George Floyd being murdered. However, we had another infamous case, which is Eric Garner's case in New York, who was murdered by the police, right, in broad daylight, over selling loose cigarettes. An uh, officer jumped on his neck and, and used the illegal police the chokehold. The case goes straight from the state to the federal level. 
because people did not feel like they could get justice on the state level in New York, a place that's supposed to be so progressive, diverse, all of that. But the reality, if we qualified it, it is not. The case went straight to the federal level under the Obama administration. Obama was president. Eric Holder was the attorney general at the time. Okay. And they did not do anything. So, and, and let me be clear what I mean by they didn't do anything. They left the case on the desk when they left the office. There were two attorney generals that were black, Eric Holder and then Loretta Lynch. Neither one of them prosecuted that case as a violation of civil rights. And this man was murdered on camera. Okay? So black president mm -hmm. does not mean, and this is why it's important for us to qualify things. It means nothing to have a black president and a black attorney general if they are too afraid to prosecute a case like that, where from beginning to end, the person's murder is captured on video. No dispute about what happened. No dispute about who did it. The coroner was braver than all of them and said that it was homicide. Okay? On that very racist island called Staten Island in New York. And it still was not prosecuted. So once again, and this is what the post this segregated, I mean, this integrated society has produced black people in positions of power, much like neo-colonialism, who act against the interest of African people, right? And now we have George Floyd, right? Everyone acts like it's the first time it happened. It's not the first time, and, and, and Barack Obama should not be making rounds talking about justice when one of the most egregious cases in recent history happened under his administration in broad daylight, okay? He cannot give the prescription. Exactly. They left the, the case on the desk for the, for the Trump administration. In other words, literally, I'm not saying- they refused to prosecute, prosecute, okay? The Trump administration comes in, they're not gonna do anything. They send the case back to the state. Five years later, the case is finally going to the state and all that, it doesn't, it's not even heard. They said, okay, no action has been taken. Let's fire the officer who did that. So five years after this man, this police officer murders Eric Garner in broad daylight over 50 cent cigarettes, he gets fired. So we shouldn't make any uh, mistake about the present condition and what, you know, Inc. has done on legal documents. It has, when we qualify things, we have to in every way know how to measure our gains and our losses, and especially in respect to our lives. And so when I talk about American citizenship, let's very be very clear. I cannot invoke the Constitution in protection of my life. The Constitution says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You cannot have liberty and pursuit of happiness if you do not have life. If I cannot invoke the constitution to protect my life i have limited citizenship okay now so this is part of the reason why you know can any of us invoke as africans in the united states the constitution to protect our lives we can go down the list all day the number of african people here who cannot get that basic protection under the law so when we use that term American, we, we need to be clear. Sure, I'm American in citizenship. I have an American passport, and that's probably the only freedom I have to travel the world. But within the United States, I cannot invoke the laws to protect my very life and all my subsequent freedoms under the Constitution. You know, and, and I can go on all day about just the structural evidence as to why we can, how we can understand this, right? Amendments to the constitution, right? 
why does the white American in the United States can simply invoke the Constitution? They have to amend the Constitution in order for it to apply to me, both both as an African and as a woman, right? In order for me to vote in this country, that has to be the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, but also the 19th Amendment to the Constitution in 1920. Two amendments for an African like me, who is both woman and African, to vote in this nation. So very conditional citizenship in terms of, you know, this idea of American, right? So we are still African people in the United States fighting uh, what is a, a really a ground zero type of fight around the value of our lives. Sorry for that, guys, but you know. No, no. <laughs> it's very interesting. Very interesting. I, I, I see parallels with what we have, what's, what's going on in the U.S. and what we see mm -hmm. happening in Africa, Absolutely. especially you know with the emergence of a, of a black bourgeoisie class in in America, and you know the the, the sustenance of a, of a black bourgeoisie class that took over. Um, the colonial authorities in Africa that even brutalized yes. African people even more than the Europeans even ever did. So we see <clears throat> the emergence of African leaders and, and a class of people who support them yes. who are hell bent on preserving the new colonial systems that we see. Very so we see so it's, it's, it's a similar parallel what's going on in Africa Very and what we similar. see happening yeah, in the United absolutely. States now. Wow, I, we could talk all day. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Wright. It was, it was excellent, and um, um, thank you for your insight. And um, I, I'd like to urge everyone to to go and check out. Yes, Ego, hang on one second uh, before we uh, before we close out. If uh, both of you gentlemen, as analysts, don't have any um, additional questions, I wanted to say to uh, Dr. Wright. I certainly, on behalf of myself, uh -huh. appreciate a very um, insightful and very good um, discussion uh, from you. Uh, I wanted to say to you that in in keeping kind of like with the traditions of uh, our show, the dark show, in many cases, um, at the end of the shows, we have um, usually had a an African proverb or, or famous <laughs> saying that yeah, yeah, yeah. Are given, uh, you know, that would be meaningful either in parallel to the theme of the show or just something that would be fruitful for okay. our, our listeners. Okay. And so at this time, I'd like to see if you have um, some words or a statement in, in the words of uh, Booker T. Washington that would be kind of apropos okay. to the uh, program we've had today. And if you wouldn't mind uh, giving some of his words that you feel like are meaningful and apropos to the content we- Sure, sure, um, right. So no problem. Uh, I'm going to uh, read just a quote. You know, the thing about the book is that I open every chapter with the quote, just to kind of give you a frame or foreshadow what is to come. So on the chapter, uh, called chapter two called Booker T. Washington, Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanists. Um, I use the quote from Washington that actually originates in um, the story of the Negro, the rise of the race from slavery, where he talks about the connections between African people. So I know that that's what you're referring to. Everyone to put my glasses on for this. <laughs> but um, Essentially, he talks about really what is, uh, in many ways, the feeling of Pan-Africanism, the shared, what we were just talking about, the shared experiences that we have. Um, and so the quote is, quote, there is, however, a tie which few white men can understand, which binds the American Negro to the African Negro, which unites the Black man of Brazil and the Black man of Liberia which is constantly drawing into closer relations all the scattered African peoples, whether they are in the old world or the new. I have rarely met in America anyone of my race who did not in one way or another show a deep interest in everything connected with Africa. The millions of Negroes in America are almost as much interested, for example, in the future of Liberia and Abyssinia 
as they are in their own country. There is always a peculiar and scarcely definable bond that binds one black man to another black man, whether in Africa, Jamaica, Haiti, or the United States. So that's Booker T. Washington. And no, nobody would think that that is Washington, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Some people had said like, hey, I don't think he's telling the truth about, you know, he seldom meets anybody in America who's interested, African person who's interested in Africa. But who knows, you know, who knows, you know, who Washington is meeting at that moment in time. Their interests uh, could have been that such, been such. But the point is, is that that final phrase where he says, you know, there is always a, a peculiar and scarcely definable bond that binds one, one black man to another black man, whether in Africa, Jamaica, Haiti, or the United States. And so in everywhere we are, he's saying that there is something that binds us, right? And, 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 and I would add to that that I would say I would add woman, <laughs> man and woman. However, I would also say that, um, you know, we have we've always had those dialectical relationships, right? Not only are we bound together, but we we are connecting and that's what when when stuff goes wrong in the united states or in the uk or in france or wherever we are on the continent that's kind of what we should be doing strategizing talking to each other strengthening our ties particularly for those of us in america strengthening our ties on the african continent okay um as viable options because i i, I don't think i'm i don't i would never accept that this is the end of our story here in america do you get what I'm saying? I think that there's a moment in time where those of us who have been in the diaspora will come back out into the world, particularly Africa, and, and, and um, you know, do some things, <laughs> you know, reestablish our relationships. We built one nation, so we can definitely do much better on the African continent, strengthening African nations just my position but anyway uh, thank you man we'll, we'll leave it there um really appreciate it it's been very enlightening we really do appreciate you taking your time and coming out to thank speak to us thank you for inviting me thank you for having me i uh, really do and uh, uh yeah so dr tyrene wright author of the book um book of D. washington in africa the making of a pan-africanist um do you have any book any new projects in the store what, what are you doing where people can find you or find your work Oh, okay, well, one, you can find the book on the website. I'm not good, at, I'm not a good social media person, but you can find me at Dr. Wright24 on Instagram. <laughs> and I, you know, I do some stuff there. And I'm working on some stuff, as, as um, already had mentioned, or we talked about before, I'm the new associate editor of the Journal of Pan African Studies. So you will see some stuff. We are putting out some issues in the the, the journal. is a thirty year old journal, but it is an online journal now, and it has been such for the last twenty years. So we're gonna, you know, the journal had a little bit of a lull in between the transition of of the uh, founder and senior editor, but we're back strong, and we're we're putting stuff out on Africa. And we have a huge contribution from intellectuals on the African continent, right? But let me say this about this book. There is a revised and expanded edition that I'm in the process of seeing who that's going to go with, right? Um, so we'll see. It'll be expanded. And, and, and this is more, this book has been for African people those of us in this conversation all over the world. So the, a lot of people, students use it on the continent, not just my students in that Pan-African course, but students at University of Zimbabwe, students in South Africa use the book. Um, however, uh, this second one is for, I will be addressing all of the people that uh, have, have uh, how, how, I'll say the intellectuals, okay? or academia, right? Um, have that conversation because this book ended up bubbling up into the academic realm, even though it wasn't, I, I took it out of that realm. 
right? But it made such good traction on the ground. Um, and it was adopted by a lot of uh, my colleagues and things of that nature. It became subject of a lot of conversation in the, the Black nationalist community here that, it, you know, it, it ended up bubbling up into academic spaces, even though, you know, it's always important when you write a book to know your audience. I wasn't talking to them. So who knew? I was, I was talking to African people who are readers of history, who need to be empowered by this information so we can know how to move in the world. Um, but now, so the other, you know, the revised and expanded version is, is, uh, is for the other folks. Um, and then I, I'm working on, on something on African women. So we don't know how that's going to be published or where that would be at, but you know, essentially a conversation around Africana womanism, the tenets of Africana womanism in our antiquity, right? Because African women in positions of power and leadership is nothing new in the world. And, uh, and we need to be empowered with that information so that our sisters who are always in the struggle uh, in some significant way can know that they're not doing it for the first time. We've been doing this since the beginning of time. <laughs> Excellent. Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you very, very much. We do appreciate you. And, All uh, right. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, gentlemen. And, uh, thank you for those who are watching. Any comments? And um, there we go. I we have comments. I've been missing them. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. comments. Um, no, 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 no questions. Just some okay. I like comments. But, um, yeah, I've also highlighted your your social media handle for those who need to reach out to you and find you okay. and find your upcoming works as well. Yes, so, and um, are we got well? You'll make the uh, the website available, which gives a lot of information. Some people said, "Oh, you give too much information on the website about the oh, what's that? But I, it's on. Uh, well, you, you have it. It's Booker T. Washington in Africa dot com. Oh, I see. Okay. I'll, I'll just put it here. You, that was actually what you were scrolling through uh, here on the. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes, so yes. that right there, you can share that. And then the third page of that site is where they can purchase the book if they're interested. Now, folks in the UK, I might want to slow down on the purchase only because uh, if you purchase. I need to find out a better way for, because I've had a lot of people in the UK um, to buy the book and then I had to reverse the orders only because the, the, the shipping was too much. So I have literally on many occasions had people from the UK meet me in the US and bring books back <laughs> to uh, the UK. That's how we got books to the UK, like literally person, you know, human delivery. So um, you can place an order, but give me a little time uh, to strategize as to what's the best way, because right now U.S. postal rates are outrageous to go, you know, to send stuff to the U.K. And I don't know. And if you if you know a better way uh, for a very light uh, book for it to, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, shipping DHL or whatever the case may be. Please do uh, comment or leave some comment or send that information because I've had that scenario before. So how I've gotten books to the UK has been through, you know, I've had people from there come here or who were here at the time and take a lot of books back, right? But the book is like much cheaper than the shipping to the UK. So I don't know why, but you know, uh, not to deter you, but just just to say that's the reality, unfortunately, uh, of uh, the postal service here and there, you know. But everybody else order, and and we are in stock after a long period of you know everything going on with the quarantine, things not moving. Mm. Only so, um, if people are interested in the book, go ahead and do that. But go ahead, read, go to the website. There's a lot of information about these cases. Uh, that you can enjoy and draw from. Okay, thank you. We would do. Uh, I'll, I'll check it out myself, and if you find a cheaper way, I'll definitely let you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, we'll be in touch, right? So yes, just to let me know because I'll check out. Actually, you can send me 
the information, I think I had mentioned that. If you send me the information, I can price them and see what is the best way to do it, right? Because I've definitely had a lot of communication with African people, brothers and sisters in the UK, yes. And, um, and a lot of them have the book. Now, how they got the book might not have necessarily been through U.S. Postal, right? They may have gotten it the ways that I've said people have bought the book there. Um, people have been here and bought the book here in the U.S. Some folks have traveled between and, and taken books back. But um, we're going to figure out something, though, because at some point or another, I will have an ebook version that's already been done, but just hasn't been released on the three platforms. And that might be more viable for people internationally. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. But I will send you. You and I will keep in touch because I will send you what what I was planning to send you before the sessions, right? So I will yes. send you portions right. of the book. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. We'll keep in touch. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you all so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Pleasure. My pleasure yeah. as well. All right. Yeah, Kwahari Sasa.